The Hurling Show, brought to you in association with Torpy. Torpy are leading hurling into a new future with Bamboo, a revolutionary hurley created using their unique engineered hurling performance know-how. Already being used by many inter-county players, Torpy's Bamboo is highly sustainable, offers players greater striking distance and a more consistent balance every time, without compromising on natural feel. Check them out on the Torpy website and in the link below and enter the promo code OURGAME to get yourself 10% off. Yes, hello and wel welcome to the Hurland Show here on Our Game. Myself, Shane Stapleton, joined as ever by this goober, Michael Verney. How's things with you? Good. I tell you what, the image that you use for this week's show is particularly apt because obviously there's a road, there's a tip man on the road. My question to you is, what road are you taking Sunday? It's obviously this, the, the Saints, two clubs, both playing similar times, different venues, Kula, the big lofty Dublin club where he's gone off and got his couple of club all Ireland medals <laughs> and Boris Lee. The homestead. So I'm wondering, are you set for Parnell Park on the Kearney Sunday or are you going down to Tom Semple's field in Turles on Sunday? Well, last weekend I was in uh, Parnell Park. Yeah, Kula uh, weren't playing last weekend. I, where are you this weekend? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've missed so many Burris games over the years by being involved with Kula that this weekend I said, I haven't been down in Burris for a while. The mother takes priesthood and I'll bring the woman down and as I said, as a treat to her, I'll bring her into Semple Stadium both days. I'm sure she's, God, she's blessed. That. She's <laughs> blessed. She loves so that. I'm, she's blessed. Yeah. So I'm going to be down in. Um, I'm going to be down in Burris over the weekend, and I'll be at both semi-finals in uh, inside in the good field in Thurles. But I'll have a, I'll have an eye on what's going on in Parnell Park the whole time. Don't you worry about that. And there's nothing sure if cooler in a county final, you'll be there with your little flag and everything. <laughs> I'd be one of the cool ultras at this stage. It'll be yeah. a full circle. Um, Joe, we've got comments in. Um, I got messaged by Stephen Tracy on the Our Game Instagram. And he says, well, guys, Stephen Tracy here from the Keown Craig Hurling Club in Glasgow was chatting to you on Instagram. I was hoping for a shout out on, on today's show. We're a new club established in 2019. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we've only gotten going this year and played our first competitive game in July 2021, hoping to challenge for a British Championship in 2022. We're the only hurling and camogie team in Scotland, and we will be the first Scottish team to compete in championship in 100 years. We're needing exposure to attract sponsors. We have a lot of travel to do. So congratulations to those in yeah. the Kevin Craig Club. It's fair going because it's not easy to do it. No, that's class, yeah. And it's definitely not easy to do. And it's probably a few expats really, really driving it there, I'd say. And that kind of brings me on to, I was only thinking as well, like next year's uh, championships, London senior hurlers and footballers are coming to come into championships that they haven't played in two years. And I'm wondering just to see even how far behind the eight ball they're going to be, particularly like the London footballers are going to be coming into D Division 4 um, and they've you know never really been up the very, very top end. Are they going to struggle? And then the hurlers are probably going to be in the Christie ring and I think they're in Division 2A or 2B. It's going to be interesting to see how they'll... Because like, without County Hurling for two years, um, they're bound to be yeah, bound to be struggling a bit. But it's great for those clubs that have, like, we're not too bad. We got to play last year, and we got to play this year, but in a lot of other places, they didn't get to play at all, so it's great that they're getting back up again. And, yeah, like, I'd say those those British championships are, are great crack because at the end of the day, they're all, like, there's a bit of, uh, they don't like each other maybe while the games are going on, but they're all the exact same people, just in different geographical locations, basically, a load of GA fanatics keeping the thing going in different places all over, all over Britain, you know, and it's great to see it. Yeah, when I was living in Canada for a year, I, I found this thing, I'd love to know what people think as well, that when you're living abroad, and lots of people who are living abroad do watch this show and let us know what you think. When I was living in, in Canada, sort of being away from home, it sort of reaffirms your Irishness, or you, you want to do something that connects with your roots. So I went training with a Gaelic football team for a while. Now, I actually, as it happened, I left for New York for the summer pretty soon after playing. Ah, there. you transferred to another club. You went off and transferred <laughs> to another club. Not yeah, like just it. For the summer. <laughs> just for the summer. But what I found was like when I was in um, Toronto, especially, you know, you're doing this ridiculous train route to get out and train at the back of some old school and the pitch is in bits because, you know, it's, it's so difficult to find a pitch. But you're just trying to do something as well as everything else just to reaffirm your Irishness. You need an outlet for the apery of being an Irish person. Yeah. And then it was the same in, in New York for the summer, albeit it was a real oasis. People know the, the Yonkers area, McLean Avenue, and it's, it's basically just like 
an Irish oasis with better weather and it's some crack over there and it's just people on the beer for the summer, uh, men and women, the whole lot. It is great stuff. I'd love to know what people think. And having that club, that oasis, home away from home, it's really, really important. Have you played abroad much or did you at all? No, uh, just it was over in London, but didn't play when it was there. Interesting. I think I think New York have officially got their second GA pitch open now. Like, or something. I saw something in recent days. There's another, basically another official place that you can play a GA. That's an official GA ground. It's not, not a, uh, you know, it's not, you know, there's not other sports been played on. It's an official GA ground, even that's outside of Gaelic Park. And just when you mentioned there about how your Irishness comes to the fore when you're abroad, like you would, you'd see a lot of Irish in, be it Dubai or wherever it is, that wouldn't have maybe been that patriotic when they were here. But all of a sudden, the Irish songs have been sang on nights out, like that they never, they would never do here. But I suppose it just you do kind of long for you long for home when you're away in those places, and those sort of things pull people together. The GA is the best example. I was out in Melbourne for the Melbourne Cup two years ago, and I met with one of the lads that's involved in one of the clubs there, and so it's fanatical out there. It really, like, it really is fanatical, and uh, it's a great outlet for them to go and meet people from home two or three times a week. And like, not been smart. The GA home or abroad. You go train and you usually go and have your few pints as well. And have your, that's a big, that's a massive part of it. And uh, when you're overseas, it's probably an even bigger part of it because people, you feel a, a bit maybe lonely sometimes when you're far, that far away from home. So uh, the GA is a great outlet like that. There's nothing like I don't know anything that you can that you can compare to it in that instance, really. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And you know JP Clarks who sponsored the the Leitrim jersey. I presume they still do, or they certainly yeah they do, do yeah yeah. Yeah, so like I used to tip in there a nice bit. Um, John Madden, who you might remember, a former Tipperary hurler, and uh, he was managing Portumna there in recent times, obviously involved as a tip, uh, with Tipperary under Mick Ryan too. I think he was working in the bar. When I first arrived there, he was working in the bar. And, you know, a few different people that I contacted online helped set me up there. And then I ended up uh, running the barbecue for a few weeks. And like the lads <laughs> I was living with, who happened to be a few of the cooler lads that I ended up uh, joining with in the club there, I'd just be telling them, look, head down to the barbecue of a Friday. There's a barbecue coming. And it's a five o'clock. Come in good and quick, and I'll, I'll be burning up a few burgers for you. So, you know, <laughs> that, that sort of great stuff. Yeah. But there's nothing like it. Like, if you're going anywhere in the world, the best way, if you're in any way affiliated with a GA club, is to just contact a GA club in wherever you're going. And they would probably sort out accommodation. They'd probably sort out with a job. And they probably get you playing with their GA club if you're going to be there for any sort of length of time. And it's that's it's a great thing, really. Yeah, without doubt. SSRI says, loving the show. Sub the year now. You both do great work in the coverage of Hurling. Appreciate that, SSRI. A regular commenter there. And please do subscribe to the channel. Bottom right-hand corner, you can press that button. Also, if you want the audio podcast, great way to support the channel, patreon.com forward slash our game a few more have uh, followed in the past week so really do appreciate that to help the, the channel build and grow i'll just run through a few more comments and one is in from another regular commenter joe butler club power rankings we will be doing them today it was an 11th hour decision but we said if we left it any longer there'd be so many clubs gone that we'll be nearly making it handy for ourselves so we want to put our necks on the block and do you know what if we get it wrong so be it have you criteria is it based on current form based on the last five years ten years i think it's more like who do we think has a fair chance of winning it? Who do we think, like, let's say, for example, you would suspect that St. Thomas's will win Galway and therefore be in the final four. But do I necessarily think I'd rank them higher than Burris Lee, who I don't think are going to win Tipperary this year, but Burris beat him well a year and a half ago. So there might be a situation where I feel, yeah, I think Thomas's will get farther, but they're not necessarily going to be higher up than another club that will get knocked out, like even Ballygunner. Do I think Ballygunner would beat Thomas's? Probably, but, you know. Yeah, and a lot of the current thing will, will take into account what form they're in now. And also, like, you know, just say with Boris Lee, if Brendan Matter is out, like, that like will seriously impinge their challenge and will seriously um, affect their positioning within the top 10 or whether they're going to be in the top 10 at all. I don't know about five to 10 years, but I would definitely be taking in the last maybe two to three years, potentially, yeah. Um, but not probably not more than three years, I'd, I'd say. But it's going to be interesting to see what way, um, what way the cards fall when we get to it later on. Yeah, and Joe adds, will it be based on county titles, all Ireland club titles, all stars representative, and the count a bit of everything, and a bit of just the whole the eye test, and just trying to weigh it up there without coming up with a formula and be like, who do I think you know is offering a little bit more? Actually, Joe adds in that uh, he'll miss a bit of the show today, but his selection is Shamrocks of Ballyhale number one, the Piercig, who are gone. 
Uh, they got knocked out of the county semi final by Patrick Swell and Limerick. Uh, Kula, St. Thomas's, Ballygunner, Turles Stars, Six Mile Bridge, Mount Leinster Rangers, Schlock Neil. Very, very interesting. We'll yeah, come to that a little good, bit yeah. later in the show, but get your comments in because uh, we absolutely. And do you know what? Tell us why. Tell us why Schlock Neil are number whatever. Tell us why, you know, Killadangan are up higher. You know, they didn't get a chance to contest Munster last year. And I'd love to have seen how they'd have gone. I think they would have done pretty well. Flash says Kim Balak are top five for him. Why Flash? That's the crucial thing. Uh, he also adds best uh, best channel on YouTube. We appreciate that. Bye. And Kesman says Gasman Flash. He said Dune would hammer. Yeah, that's a fact. Yeah, that's a fact. He did. He did. We have him in the top five of the country. <laughs> so he, he admits he got that one wrong. Uh, do you know what? We we want to say wish everyone best of luck in the Fela. I saw Clon Lara, who were um, you know a county or a club that you've obviously hammered a nice bit over the last couple of years, but they had a, they put up a tweet saying. Uh, so this was obviously, I think it was yesterday ahead of this morning, Thursday, if you're watching it today, uh, with us live, where they said, can everyone come out at, I think it was like 10 past nine before the bus leaves for Money Gall. That's obviously where they were playing. And um, just can everyone come out and give them a bit of a send off? So I think that was lovely. That was great. So, I mean, you know, finally, maybe you'll give a bit of credit to Clan Lara. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's, it, there's nothing like the fail. At, uh, that, it is a big deal, you know, and usually... Clubs will get go to their maybe meeting their GA pitch or meeting their you know the middle of their town, get a picture taken, and be people there wishing them the best of luck. Uh, I believe Keen Lynch is in Money Gall this morning. I think to help with the the launch of it as it starts as well. Um, so I uh, listen. I never had the the good fortune of playing in a fela, but by all accounts, from you know talking to several people who did, it's a, an unbelievable experience. Particularly if you're going traveling. Um, as it was back in the day, whether you were going up to Derry or going to Galway or whatever, and staying with a family, and um, was it was it Keelan Kylie that stayed with some of the Limerick lads? I forget. Yeah, Aaron Galan Galan stay with him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah. There's, a, there's a clip on the our game thing for Keelan yeah. Kylie. He says that Aaron Galan wouldn't sleep with the lighter. <laughs> <laughs> like I just think that stuff like that is brilliant as well, and it also it's like college connections when you play fits with someone and then you make meet them in a club game 10 years ago you still have that link with them and the failure link is a great link as well yeah it certainly is um just so what the the weather is changing massively and you know who are the best teams you've seen in the wet and you know i mean who's the best winter hurler so a team that i've seen really excel in the winter kilcormick kalahi no better team to dog you out of it in the winter than kilcormick and I obviously mean that as a complete compliment. Yeah, no, they will definitely be one that will come to mind. Uh, I never forget that. That it's very funny actually. Went into uh, I teach with I used to teach with John Grogan, who was cornerback on that Kilcarmock team, and we we were going to a match. Uh, forget where we were going to a match. It was maybe two days before the All Ireland Club semi final against Turles. And we stopped into a shop in Ross Gray and I met a fella from Borough who lives in Ross Gray and he met John as well and whatever. He says, well, how do you think the Kilcormick boys will go? He didn't know who John was. And he just said, ah, sure, I think Kilcormick have a great chance. Sure, them Grogan's, they don't give a damn. They'll pull timber or whatever. And she even like, got a clue who he was talking to. Right? <laughs> Anything like that. But that's one kind of abiding memory. And uh, I think there were like, massive underdogs going into that game, but they really excelled in the winter. Really, really I remember them. They really ground out uh, Owlert in that Leinster final as well. Uh, other teams that would that would excel, I have to say, like, the worse the conditions got, uh, the better Boris Lee got the year to one Munster as well. Like me and you were both down in Parky Rin that day. It was like an ice rink. And they were just loving that. And the conditions were similarly bad when they played Thomas's in the All Ireland semi final down in the Gaelic grounds. And they absolutely excelled. So, like, the best that Boris Lee team has ever hurled is in, you know, as wintry conditions as you'll ever get. So, they'd be one that would spring to mind as well. Uh, I Like, if you look at the teams that got to finals and, and semi finals over the last few years, you probably have to say the likes of Napiershig don't mind it. Ballier didn't massively mind it, even when they had a huge turnover for between their two monster titles. You know, they didn't mind it and they kept going. Who else? I mean, to be fair, like Kula didn't mind it. Everyone would think, you know, Dalky side, Softies, all that, etc. etc. Didn't really matter. Obviously, won the the All Ireland's Bally Hale don't seem to mind. They'll do it in any weather with you. Um, I wonder anyone else particularly coming to mind. Is there anyone of those Galway teams? Of course, Port Humna won those All Irelands, so you'd have to put them in there. They obviously didn't care either. Yeah, I suppose what what you were trying to find is a team that really gets better in those conditions, if you know what I mean. Portumna, Kula, Napiershig would play in any conditions where there are some teams 
the the sloppier it gets. The, I'm not being smart, and this is the biggest compliment ever. The more heart and doggedness that's required, the better they get. Because those types of days um, where you're going out and you can't feel your hands and the conditions are just awful and you wouldn't put a dog out in it, there are some teams absolutely come to life in those conditions. And with due respect to the Kilcormick lads, I would say that Dave would get even better in those conditions. And that's only a compliment in my book. Because anything that, anything that you know, points to you need more reserves inside you and finding that bit more dog inside you, um, that can only be that can only be a positive aspect in my view. So they'd definitely be one. And I have to say, Boris Lee, even though you've only seen one winter campaign, they would definitely be another. Some some players get that bit of um, encouragement when the weather is bad, almost with the idea that they think your man there with the socks pulled up and with the nice wrist tape and the, the jersey kind of half tucked in and half tucked out, who thinks a lot about his appearance. He won't fancy this today. That's a hundred percent. Yeah, no, definitely with, with his white socks underneath underneath his club socks. We uh one of one of my clubmates uh ordered socks for us, the short kind of ankle socks, and I wouldn't have been a big fan of them until recent years. And we got the socks, and then all of a sudden we got them and like they were three quarters white. Like the white was up halfway up your calf, like, and then it was green and red, and it said burr on it. So I actually had to fold the green and red down to cover the white because I just in my head I'd be like, Jesus, what are you doing going out here? You look like an absolute fancy Dan. This does not suit you. You're agricultural, you're not fancy. Just get back into your box or whatever. But um, yeah, no, that would definitely be one. And um, I'd like I'd say there are some players who when you're marking somebody in July and conditions are prime, you're thinking, okay, this is the forwards, prime conditions, you know, fast ball, ball in hand or whatever. You get to October, you get to November, get to the conditions now and you're just thinking, like, this is my world now. This is not, you know, all about first touch or anything like that. This is all about, you know, throwing your leg, throwing your arse, throwing anything in over a ball. That's 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 the way it is. That's what it is this time of the year. Uh, the boys always say in, in Burr, um, it comes from greyhound terms, but like, have you what sort of trap tree have you got? <laughs> trap tree is always supposed to have heart in the greyhounds. Have you got much trap tree? And this time of the year, we'll always test your trap tree. <laughs> <laughs> and then the players that stand out in the winter, like who, who would stand out when you think of that Kilcormick team? Kieran Slevin always never minded knocking over the freeze in any weather. TJ Reid, of course, for Bally Hale, maybe even more so in some way, um, Colin Fenley. Yeah. Because in the winter, you badly need to knock the ball into him, him turn and go. To be fair, Con David Tracy has hit some unbelievably difficult freeze. And obviously, he played very well. We'll be talking a bit more about Kula and his performances this year later on. Will O'Donoghue, I think, has been quite good. Uh, Adrian Breen, an absolute nightmare to deal with. And Peter Casey as well. So I suppose it is a lot of those teams that are going to come up time and again. Yeah, some lads just motor. Bigger lads tend to motor wetter, uh, or motor better, I should say, on the wetter ground like the helians with kilcormick used to excel around this time of the year because when people would think maybe potentially that they could get at them during the summer for pace they were rarely able to get at them in the winter and they were just able to, you're able to cover more ground in the winter the lads that are making the shorter steps on the good ground that's fine but if you're a big lad and you're making you're making big inroads on lads uh, I don't know who would definitely want just plows through the ground. Nick Fenley would be another one mm. who just plow through that kind of winter ground. Fenley, you're right, 100% right about Colin Fenley because he could just horse the ball down the top and he's going to make it so difficult. Even if he didn't get the ball, he's going to make it so difficult for the opposition man because he'd just be legs and arms and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Get your comments in. Who do you think are the best winter hurlers and the best winter teams? We're going to talk about the Tipperary Championship now. Uh, two big semi finals this weekend Kiladangan against Thurla Sarsfields, Burris Lee against Lockmore. They're in the stadium on Saturday and Sunday. Um, I was speaking with Owen Brislan and Shane Brophy on Tipcast this week. So here's a little clip of Owen Brislan teeing up the game. He's the Tumivara hurling manager and obviously involved at Tipperary, of course, uh, in, in years gone by. So here's his thoughts. For winter hurling, you need ball winners. And, uh, I, and I suppose if there is a question mark over Kildangan, right? Um, and they don't have many. Like, they, like as you said there, Shane, they're, they're extraordinarily even. Right? Very balanced team. Like, the, like they'll probably go along. And like Dan O'Mara, they'll probably go along and, hit, hit, and try and hit the inside line with Dan O'Mara, Billy Seymour, Brian Malotny. Like, okay. Mm. But... but uh, it's ball winners are looking for, right? And I suppose, um, do Torres have them? 
is my question. Do hurlers have people that in their half forward line that when 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 the pressure is on, to go up with their hand up, catch a high ball, and win win that win that dirty ball? Okay, Dennis Maher's inside, uh, Paddy Creedon's inside. That's where I think um, Kildang will 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 come out on top there. Uh, if they if they can win, if they can keep the if they can we dominate there in in, in the Kildang and half back line. Alan Flynn is in top form. Davis Sweeney is a really good player. Dickie McGrath, they're strong. Um, I do. I agree with you, Shane. I think. I'd fancy Kildang all the way here. I actually don't think this is the game of the weekend. I, I, don't, I think the game, the other game is the, other, is the game of the weekend, I feel. I think that more Bursley is, is going to be a really, really good game. I think the Bursley haven't performed this year at all. And um, like you'd, like I said to you last day, Shane, on the podcast that I fancy Bursley to win the, win the county final. And I'm kind of going, I, I, I fancy him to kind of put Mullinahoe away, away kind of easy enough and they really struggled and now Kevin Maher's out. Brendan has an injury, I think he's playing. You probably have her inside that does, Shane, but um he's by all accounts it's a knee injury. How bad it is, how we don't know. But like um uh, I just on this game here, the Thorless and, and Kildang game, I actually think Kildang will win this game and will win it comfortable enough. He fairly called it there, didn't he? He's not afraid to call it, even the no. time you had him on before um There'd be no fence sitting there anyway. He'll definitely oh plant him, plank himself like well away from the fence anyway on either side. Um, yeah, I, listen, I, I probably would I probably would fancy Kiladangan, but Jesus, there must be a lot of hurt on the Turles side from how things have gone in recent years. I need to be expect- going to catch that in. It's grand to be hurt, like, but that doesn't mean you have the, the quality on the field. They've got plenty of quality. Yeah, but <laughs> they it doesn't mean, they're not a balanced side to me. Right, so they've obviously got a very good spine, like at club level, having Paddy Maher and Rona Maher as your full and centre back. I mean, you'd think straight away, glorious. Then they played against Clonolty the last day. One had pulling up, I would say, to some degree. And they Clonolty played with one less forward, allowed Rona Maher to be free. Kiladangan are not going to do that. And he hit the world of ball and absolutely destroyed them. But it's from there on that I think there's problems in terms of balance because Mickey Cahill is playing midfield with Stephen Cahill. And I don't think it necessarily suits Michael Cahill. And Stephen Cahill, you see him coming into the game when he's on the ball and striking the ball over the bar. He's brilliant at doing that. So to me, the midfield, I'm not sure if they present the sort of defensive screen that you would want. And then the forward line, as Owen Brislan mentions there, where, like, yes, Dennis Maher is a very combative player. I'd say naturally more of a back than a forward. And then Paddy Creedon, 19 years of age, I think he is. He's a good ball winner too. But after that, I'm just not sure there's enough of a ball winner. Whereas you look at the Kiladangan team and they're just known. You, you wouldn't look at any player and say he's kind of playing out of position there or that's a square peg in a round hole, which I would say is the case with Hurts. I would be assuming um, if they don't have a load of ball winners uh, that they will be playing a lot into space and that Paddy McCormick could be trying to find grass rather than trying to find two bodies under, under a puck out. I'd, I'd, I'd imagine so. They, they've always been like that, though, really. They've, like Obviously, Redzer was there and maybe Lara was there and would have been played outside at different times, maybe. But they've never had a massive amount of ball winners. That's kind of what you're, what you're essentially saying is, is that we know they have loads of forwards who are really, really good on the ball and will hurt you on the ball. But will they be able to get the ball? That's always been the problem. And they've been ground out on different occasions. Kilcormack did it that day in Port Leash. Um, I think Bally Gunner have done it a couple of days. They, they prob- that's one of the main reasons that they haven't been able to kick on and win the All-Ireland title. That Manny would, Manny would say that, uh, that they had the talent to do that. But like, are, are Kildangan that physical of a force in the half-back line? Would he be that dominant in the half-back line, even if Turles do have to launch a few balls down, that they're going to get absolutely cleaned out? I just think they're, they've got to just... Right, so Paul Flynn will be... Sorry, Alan Flynn will be has been playing centre-back. But David Sweeney looks like he'll be back. He's been centre-back for the last few years. Very good at mopping up ball, as is Alan Flynn. So they're unbelievably mobile. And because Turles don't have lads that are necessarily going to put the hand up and catch puck outs, straight away you're not going to expose Kiladang in that way. Unless they bring Dennis Maher out half forward line, which they might do, and he starts winning a few puck outs. Maybe Pa Burke will come out to wing forward and win the odd one. But I, I see him staying inside. Now, if you give him room, he's going to destroy you. And like he did the last two games, he's going to absolutely stretch the net with fierce shots. But I just don't see that... Kiladangan can be exposed on that puck out. I also think their midfield are more natural midfielders and Ty Galler, who's very pacey, and uh, Willie Connors, who's obviously been involved with Tip, 
And notably, do you remember last winter when he was playing a lot for Tipperary? In the winter weather, his unbelievable first touch allowed him to play really well. I think that day against Cork especially, remember it was monsoon-like weather, he was really good. Then in the forward line, you've got six foot three Dan O'Mara probably playing in the full forward line. He hasn't been playing particularly well. He was poor against Upper Church, but like he could do a bit of damage. Joe Gallagher's a ball winner. Billy Seymour is obviously a tip panelist, you know, scoring goals for fun a couple of years ago for the under 21s or oh, under Flynn. 20s. Yeah. Um, you've also got Sean Hayes, who has so much pace to burn from the half back line, half forward line. And I don't know if Turles, I just don't know if Turles match up well here. And they haven't won a county title since 2017. So it's not like the aura is there anymore. No, the aura is definitely not there anymore. And I think teams have probably realised how they can get at them. Uh, I would say Kiladangan, like, on the flip side of what you said about Turles, Kiladangan are a very balanced side. It's hard to it's hard to look at an area and think, OK, we could really go, go at them here. Um, they are very, very balanced all over. They've mobility all over. They've got... It, it's kind of... They're, even their big players are mobile players. They're not, you know, big kind of cumbersome players. They're mobile players as well. They've got pace in every li- in every line of the pitch. Uh, they've obviously got, you know, county goalie as well, which is helps at this time of the year too. Huge. That, that, yeah, that he's able to find, uh, that he's able to, obviously he's a monster of a puck out. He could put it down to the far 45 and a bit further, even at this time of the year. But he'll also be able to pick out a puck out anywhere out the pitch. Killingham can go along if they need to. They'll go through the lines a lot. Um, I do see teams going a lot more direct. We talked about conditions earlier. Uh, there's a lot of work, would you say, from a sharp puck out now at this time of the year with the way pitches are. There's a lot of work to get the ball into that scoring area that, you know, if you really want to kill teams in around the D, whereas, you know, uh, Barry Hogan can just launch ball down there if they need to. The key is at this time of the year is to, for teams not to know what he's going to do. They need to be able to go out short the odd time to keep the other team honest and pull them up. And then when they go maybe man a man, then they can put balls down. The likes of Sean Hayes and a few others can contest them. But um, it's, it, it, will, it will be interesting. Tur- like, what type of a game is it going to be? If it's going to be like a real uh, kind of high-scoring game where it's free-flowing and forwards are getting time on the ball, you'd imagine, not that that would favour Turles, but did you imagine Turles put up a good score? But if I was any team playing Turles, I'd be thinking... If we get in their faces here and force them to try and win 50-50 or 40-60 ball, particularly in attack, will they be able to do it? And they will not make Rona Matter look like a hero like Clonauti did. I, I just don't... That it just makes no sense to me how he would leave one of the best hurlers in the country free. And not even one of the best hurlers in the country, but one of the best players on the ball. Why would you leave him free? It makes no sense. Whereas I think Kiladangan would try and take him out of the game completely. Yeah, and they might put Sean Hayes in centre forward and, and say, stand off him a little bit and go running for space and give Ronan that decision to make. Um, there's definitely one other player that we should have mentioned that um, that I haven't brought up just yet, arguably the premier forward that Killadangan have, which is Paul Flynn, who's been involved with Tipperary the past couple of years. Now, there is talk that he's carrying a bit of an injury at the moment, but his matchup with Paddy Maher could be very interesting. And if you look at, like, when Clonolty were at their worst the last day, and you know what? They made a decent fist of it as the game went on. They were at their worst when they went long and high because, obviously, they were playing with an extra man back, so that meant that they were a bit shy in the forward line. So going high on top of Paddy and Ronan, etc. you know, best to look at that. That's going to work out really well. But when they put Connor Hammersley, who's a smaller, faster type player, into the full forward line and played nice ball in, measured ball in, they won a load of frees and they got their scores. So to me... You play a nice measured ball, which Kiladangan like to do. They're very good on the ball. And you play a lovely ball in in front of Paul Flynn. Now, this is the guy who stood up when everyone else around him was probably pretty subdued in the county final last year. Remember when Lockmore started very well and maybe got a couple of goals on the... Didn't they get a couple of goals yeah. on the board early? It wasn't Paul Flynn the lad who stood up and dragged them back into the game? He got seven points from playing last year's county something, final, was it? Yeah. Something crazy like that. Yeah. I haven't even mentioned Brian Malachny either, the guy who scored the, the winning goal last year. Yeah. So... Um, but am I overstating Kiladangan here? Am I not giving enough hop to a Thurless team that does have so many players who played at Tipperary over the years? No, probably not. But you ha- but you have an opinion on a game, and you're you like in fairness, you've been you've been kind of calling Kiladangan from a long way out here. I do think it was interesting, right? With Tipperary this year, um, uh, tell me if I'm wrong here, but 
Pauly Matter was playing full back or in the full back line. And to me, it always looked like they were trying to find a matchup for him. Uh, this is just me, for him to survive in the full back line. They were, they were picking a forward. Like it was, uh, let's say, Patrick Horgan when they played Cork in the league. It was someone who wasn't going to murder him for pace. Um, not, this is not to say that Seamus Flanagan is slow, but it was maybe Seamus Flanagan when they played Limerick. They tried to find someone who was a matchup for him. Whereas uh, at Club Hurling here, you'd, you'd imagine that Kiladangan or Clonauti, as they did with Conor Hammersley, that Kiladangan will try and find you know, the worst matchup for him. You know, and to try and make him feel very, very awkward. Try and even, I know it's it's heavy ground, but put in that nippier kind of forward that's going to really put him on the back foot if they get a ball. It's going to go a ball and kind of take him on. They're not going to. You know, I don't think any team is going to put. Like I don't. I wouldn't see Billy Seymour being in on top of him. You know, for massively long spells and them horsing high ball in. I just don't see that happening. But um. Yeah, I just think Kildanga will try and move him around. I, I think they'll go after the two pillars in defence. I think they'll try and move Paddy around as much as possible. And I think they'll try and take Ronan out of the game completely if they can. I think it's going to be a really good game, though. I mean, I, I'm backing Kildanga here and relatively forcefully, but I don't think there'll be more than a puck of a ball in it. You know, So I think you can do that. You can heavily favour one side, which is Kildanga. Because they've also found a way to get through a load of tight games through this year. Like, look at uh, the game that they had with J.K. Brackens. Now, obviously, not everyone is tipping them to be winning the county title, but they won a tight game there. In the North, they won a tight game against Killer One. They they beat Lockmore, who they beat by, a point. like, obviously, the last score of the game last year in the county final. They beat them just by one point, I think, in the original group game. They're just finding ways to get through all the time. And, you know, as we said before, They've only lost one game in Tipperary Club competition, sorry, Championship Club competition since the start of the 2019 Championship. I mean, that's unbelievable consistency. Yeah, no, it is, in fairness. I'm just looking back because I remembered that Turles had given them a fair hockey in a county final. It was 2016. Turles, mm. 20, 27 points, Kiladang in 115. That was their first ever county final appearance, so they'd be right in saying. Um, there's an awful lot has changed since then. The fact that Kiladang have, the mon- have the monkey off their back there will no, there will be no, you know, not to say that it would have been anyway, but there's be no fear of Turles whatsoever. If anything, they'll be sticking their chests out and saying that you know we are the team now, and Turles are the ones that have to come up to the bar- mark, not the other way around. And if anything, maybe it's it's Turles that could potentially could have that mental, you know, frigidity maybe coming into this because they haven't been in around the scene the last two or three years, whereas Kiladangan have kicked on massively. I do think. I think it'd be massive for Kiladangan if they were to win two in a row ha- after the heartbreak maybe they had in recent years. And I do think mentally that they're in a position that where they could do that. And I just think they've, they've a lot of guys that can hurt you in different places. They have two or three forwards that could be off colour as they were in the county final last year and they could still beat you. Brian Malachny, who was taken off quiet, came back in and scored, I think, one, two, didn't he? Like, turned the game, basically. They, they can hurt you in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Now, to be fair to Thurles, they have the best player in the field in Rona Maher, and they have the best ball striker in the field in Pa Burke. Now, there, there's other lads who probably wouldn't be too far off in terms of ball striker, but I mean, I'd stand there and watch Pa Burke just hit freeze in the warm up all day. He's just got a glorious strike. <laughs> Man, <ball>. Pa. <laughs> yeah, so from, from that point of view, they do have quality. There's no doubt about it, but. I'm just still. Uh, I'm. Just, I think we're both just slightly edging with Kildangan. Dep- depends what type of a game. If it's a real open game, Turles will put up a big score. Now, I will put will will put up a big score as well. But I just don't see. Uh, I don't see Kildangan allowing Turles to play on their terms. I don't like see them. They're they're very tactically astute side. They won't allow big. You know big, massive areas of space inside that Turles forward line where Aidan McCormick, Pa Burke and these guys will be able to just move into space and pick off points by themselves. I just don't see that happening. Uh, I do think it will be a lot tighter than maybe we're suggesting. And I, but I probably would see Kildang and winning with three or four. Yeah, comments coming in. the in heel there. of the hunt, as you say yourself. In the heel of the hunt, yeah. <laughs> Tony Kelly is unbelievable in winter, uh, to be fair, and summer, obviously. So that's referring back to who are the players who really excel in winter. Obviously, tongue-in-cheek comment here from James uh, S. referring to Billy Seymour. I'd like to see more balls from Tip next year. Maybe you will. Maybe you'll see a bit more of Billy, too. Uh, John Collins, North Tip man backs, North Tip team. Shock. Kiladangan didn't show any great form putting away Upper Church. No, they started the game very slowly but completely took over. Um, but Upper Church will be disappointed with their performance or their, their score uh, conversion rate. So, you know, that's that's a fair point. So I, I'll take you on that. But I don't think there's any great favoritism towards Kiladangan. 
I mean, why would a North Tip man have Graw for another North Tip team? In in any way, in any other walk of life, you'd be saying he'd be rooting against the North Tip. Yeah, there should be more hatred for the North Tip, if anything. <laughs> uh, it wasn't me, says Kiladangan haven't been at their best this year, but I still think they've enough to get over the line. Uh, Shane, will you be at the Fingalians game on Sunday? I won't. I'll be down in uh, Tipperary. Uh, Mark Corker and the smart money is on Kiladangan, but no other team in Tip can match fi- uh, can catch fire like Turles. Huge game for this Kildangan team. This will show us if they're going to dominate the club scene. I'm not sure anyone is going to dominate the club scene in Tipperary. I think it'll be the way it's kind of poised at the moment. You could have different winners for the next four or five years. I think they have a nice age profile to be there or thereabouts for the next four to five, four or five, six years, mm. I'd say. Um, yeah, I, and it would be a dangerous prospect for everybody else if they did win back to back, I yeah. think. Uh, Raharni are a tough, dogged winter team. Bet Kulderi in 2010 and Ran Kilcormick and Owl are very close in other years and were unlucky to lose. Uh, did they also beat uh, Ballyboden? I don't that know that. that. Clonkill, remember, oh, drew at Ballyboden after, after extra, or drew at them in normal time and got beaten after extra time a couple of years ago in wintry conditions. Um, so they would, be another, they would be another good winter side as well, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to remember if they did or didn't. Maybe it was Clan Kill. Um, another comment in here. Is this game televised? No, but it'll be on the Tip GA stream. John Collins just saying, I've seen a pattern, speaking as a Corkman observing. I wasn't impressed by Killadang in the last day. Both sides beat very poor teams at quarter final stage, so it's hard to tell. Uh, Shane, will you be coming down to Limerick for a game next year? Oh, I more than likely will. Andy Ryan, Classic Barbers. Not sure what Tony Lanigan is touching on there, but there you go. Uh, let's see. Bally Gunner will deal with whoever comes through tip. Would you expect anyone from the B teams to make an appearance off the bench after getting knocked out? That could, could happen. I'm not 100% sure, Parik, off the top of my head, who from the B teams might uh, appear. But I think Tipper- or Turles' B team, maybe also Kiladangan's B team, they, they probably have players now available to the first team. I saw Lara was number 22 on the B team the last day, but he's the sort of player that could easily um, move from number 22 on the B team to number 22 on the A team to coming in for the last five or ten minutes. Uh, a lot of the, the older guys in particular, guys that maybe have dropped back a grade, there's always the idea in their head that they would be potentially used by the seniors you know, if their second team is out, if they're needed at the end of the year. So, and Lar or these guys, these older guys in particular, would not have been training for, you know, May or June. They would be training to be just coming right here to be ready at this time of the year. It's a difficult one, though, like, particularly if you, if you played a full B game, to come in then and try and play 10 or 15 minutes for the A's is tough. I definitely wouldn't be able to do it at this stage anyway. Um, Kilkenny Ailes says I hope the Locks beat the Shamrocks next Sunday Shamrocks looking class though they certainly are and we'll preview that later in the week we'll move on to Burris Lee against Lockmore Castellini that's on this uh, Sunday inside in the stadium I think it's going to be a cracking game but you've kind of already touched on the fact that Burris Lee may be down a player or two so Kevin Maher who's the centre back for the Tipperary under 20s obviously didn't have a great season but it kind of tells you he's obviously a quality player if he's picked in that position for the Tip 20s He's out with a suspension for a helmet pull in the quarter, from the quarterfinal against Mulnahone, which Burris Lee won after extra time. Now, Mulnahone had only come up from the Seamus Oreen level the year before, topped their group, but most people would have expected Burris Lee to come through that game without too much fuss, but made very, very hard work of it. And even after going down to 14 men with Kevin Maher getting sent off, he took a late revival, four or five points down. Niall Kenny scored a goal, kind of led the team over the line. Uh, I'm not sure if Connor Kenny was 100% going into that game. Hopefully, he's 100% going into this one. Brendan Maher had to come off with a knee injury. Now, he, Johnny Maher was interviewed during the week, I think, by local media. Johnny he, Kelly. Johnny sorry, Maher, Johnny not great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <sorry. laughs> Pulling strokes. <laughs> <laughs> so, perhaps Brendan will be playing in this game, but I don't know if he'll be 100% fit. Um, so, there's one or two other injury issues. I'm not going to give away the ghost on in Burris Lee. But then Lockmore last week they won um, a very low scoring football quarter final. I think it was nine points like, to one five, yeah. Something ridiculous like yeah. that, yeah. But they battled through that game, obviously wintry enough conditions for the game. And they looked very good against Killer One. I mean the, the headline from that was four six from John McGrath, four five of that coming in the first half. But Killer One just opened up the back door and said, lads, do you want to walk through there and score a few goals? They didn't put a lay a glove on Lockmore. Now, Bursley, obviously, I've talked about too much long ball, but they're not going to let you walk through for four goals. So I think this game could be a bit of all-out war in like a very physical sort of game. Well, you know something? 
the expectation is not usually on lock more. They're usually not underdogs in games, but the opposition is maybe, you know, and particularly last year, we were probably talking about the opposition maybe more than them, and you're wondering about the fatigue in their legs from, play, from playing football and hurling week on week. This week, the, op- the pressure is not on Boris Lee, particularly if Brendan Matter is carrying an injury, Kevin Matter is out, as you say. The pressure is probably on lock more this time around, and most people, I'd imagine, would be tipping them uh, outside of Owen Brislan will be tipping them to get to the to get to the final just because the cards look a little bit stacked in their favour here. Uh, but when Boris Lee won the county title, the, like a lot of things were against him. I think they were the outsiders of eight in the quarterfinals, outsiders of four in the semi-finals, outsiders in the final then as well. There was out there were outsiders nearly the whole way through Munster as well. So maybe that type of uh, siege mentality or you know the the old classic GA were been written off will play to their favour again because I I definitely have it in my head that they're going to struggle this weekend. Maybe not struggle, but that they're definitely just a combination of factors probably takes two or three points away from them and makes things an awful lot harder this weekend. Well, I suppose 2019, everything that could go right for Burris Lee did go right. So by that, I mean the injury front mainly because uh, Shane Kenny, I think, did a cruise that year, but more or less everyone else was available throughout the campaign. Whereas now we've kind of listed the different sort of injuries and the team has kind of been changing most days. Even Kieran Maher had been playing. This is the guy who scored the goal in the 2019 Monster Final against Bally Gunner. He'd been playing in the back line and then he ends up wing forward scoring three points the last day. Uh, JD was kind of getting scores a bit more freely, James Devaney. It's not really happening for him at the moment. Even though like he has been contributing in terms of like a goal might have come off some work he did, but he's just not getting into the game quite enough. And he wasn't brought in during extra time the last day after being taken off in normal time. Neither was Kieran Maher after scoring three points. So um, That might be a good thing. That, like, it might they, be. It might be they, the they Rockets. Definitely, yeah, they definitely come with a point to prove, like, without a doubt. Like, it, you would be fairly sickened, but the fact that the guys that came in, fresh guys came in and actually made a difference, you'd hope that would spur those lads on a bit more. They didn't mm-hmm. get a second chance. This is their second chance now on Sunday. And it's going to be tough for Brendan to recover the 2019 and early 2020 form when he's obviously carrying an injury. Like, he got injured during the game the last day out and he went up to the full forward line and one ball went in and he wasn't able to really go for it. So to be able to turn it around in 16 days and be hopping off the sod, you wouldn't be entirely sure there. You know, so it's like it, I'm just saying things aren't quite working quite as smoothly on the injury front. I, from, a, from the Brendan Matter point of view there, it sounds like this is just why I'm thinking. It sounds like he's going to be trying to survive rather than thrive, if you know what I mean. He'd be trying to, like, he won't be able to, you know, make that burst like he made in the, the Munster final on a loose ball. He won't be able to do those things. He won't be able to, maybe he won't be able to, uh, when he does get a ball, to take on his man every time. He'd be trying to do maybe the safer thing. You know you've been in that position. I've been in that position as well, where maybe you just don't feel you have the training done in recent weeks or something like that. So you have to take the safer option. And they need him at his dynamic best. So I definitely think that takes a nice bit away from him. Yeah, and obviously Boris Lee will um, will use the, the twin towers of the Kennys for a long ball at times. And, uh, you know, but to me, getting Jerry Kelly into the game, getting James Devaney into the game, you know, that's very important too. Obviously, Eddie Ryan has been hitting the freeze over like he's a young lad who's just stepped straight in and it's no bother to him at all. Try and get the ball to him also and not go long quite as often. Because if you do, I don't think that um, Lockmore would be particularly perturbed. Look at the half back line. John Ryan is a big physical club fullback who's always been very consistent. John Maher, former county footballer on the Tipperary Hurling panel, brilliant at club level with Lockmore, uh, former Tip under 21 also. And then Brian McGrath, who's a coming back for yeah. Tipperary, driving out with the ball. So would you be overly perturbed if you were Lockmore here? And, hey, there's going to be plenty of snow coming on these deliveries. I don't mind. No, I think they'd lap it up. Uh, I think they'd lap it up and Boris need to probably mi- need to mix it up because if they're going to play that game with them, with that kind of... Like, I've never seen uh, John Matter in the... Now, oh, all the way through last year. He was, he, was, he was brilliant. He was just mopping up ball, mopping up ball with his kind of, that kind of lefty style. And Brian McGrath, after getting better, more exposure with Tipperary. I, was, I thought he did well with Tip, actually, this year. I'm surprised he didn't probably play more than he did. Um, and that's a, that's a strong club half back line. And if Boris play into their hands, uh, I'd say they rude if they play into their hands like that with long ball. But the default seems to be, at times, just to go along when they're under a bit of pressure, particularly, as you mentioned, Dan McCormick is one who does tend to go longer more often than not. 
but they'll need to be they'll need to be smarter if they're just horse and ball down on top of there. Don't see them. I don't see them winning that battle if they play, if they play it like that. Whereas if they try and move around the half back line a bit more and try and get obviously get the ball in over their heads, that would uh, that would definitely play to their strengths a bit more. Like JD, he can't it can't be high ball coming down on top of him, or if he's going into if, if he's a half forward, if he's in in corner forward, it needs to be a good delivery of ball. It can't be just this big ball down on top of the corner back and the corner forward. It just won't work. Yeah, so I think I think the the problem for Johnny Kelly is that he's trying to figure out how can I put my pieces together here, given who's out at the moment, and and try and piece the team together. Whereas you look at Lockmore, they seem pretty even. They've Liam McGrath back this year; he's looking good. Uh, Evan Sweeney is still popping up with scores. No McGrath most likely going to play centre forward against Dan McCormick. What way will that work out? And then John McGrath, who do Burris Lee put on him? Now, I'm not necessarily. Sh- it might be Kieran Cohen starting off him, big physical guy, but it might it might be Seamus Burke because he, he's quite fast, he's quite aggressive, he's a good hurler. I think he'd probably be the most likely of the options available there at the moment. But you know, tying down the two McGraths isn't going and the other McGraths isn't going to be easy. Noel is in, or sorry, not Noel. John is in different form this year than he was last year as well. But looks mm. at things, looks like he's got a pep in his step, and uh, just even the instinct for that goal at the start of the. The quarterfinal last day, just that to have, just to have, he ha- seems to have his natural instinct back a bit more and that bit more confidence, and that's definitely another another worry for Bursley. I just maybe it's too simplistic, but I I would look at it being. I think it'll be a repeat of last year's county final. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I do it like it'd be Kildangan and Lockmore again for me. Yeah. Okay, well, I I can't go against my own, obviously, as you know. Hey, you're a journalist. You call it as you call it as you see it. Heart comes out of it here. And I'm saying this, I've probably called Offley to win games that they were beaten by 15 or 20 points in. <laughs> well, look, I'm just hoping Burris Lee can find a way to do it. But seeing as you want to talk about your own there, Data 6 says, Burr got very unlucky in the Offley Championship. There's no luck. You got knocked out and that's the end. No, no I'd, agree. I'd agree there. We had a great performance in the last day, but the last day was too late, unfortunately. And we had uh, we dug ourselves a hole. I mean, nearly dug ourselves out of it, but we didn't. So, no, luck doesn't really come into it now. Nearly never pulled a cow. There you go. Yeah, well, you didn't know about Beeston's last year, so I'm surprised you even knew that saying. Sure, I didn't grow up on a farm. What do you want me to do? <laughs> Sean O'Sullivan says, don't care what you're say, uh, seeing. Lark coming in at any stage can suck the life out of a team. Neem, need Liam Sheedy on standby to do his famous finger <laughs> wag like it's 2010 <laughs> all over again. It wasn't me, says, I think Lockmore will have too much for Burris Lee. Um, Bazaroni says, Kilkenny intermediate semi-finals looking tasty. Two North teams playing against each other and two Southern teams matching up. Thomastown against Glenmore, is that right? And St. Lactons against Fenians? Yeah, that's the one, yeah. And obviously, there'll be, uh, there'll be a fair bit of attention on Henry this weekend. And I think the, the most of the photographers got him, in, got him in the crowd at the Ballyhale game last weekend as well. But everyone, anything other than Thomastown winning the Kilkenny Championship will be seen as a massive failure. And, and it's just that we're so reactionary as well. It'd be like, oh, geez, if they don't win, oh, geez, Henry didn't get Thomas down over the line or whatever. So, like, it'll just, it's just going to be expected that they're going to win. And uh, it won't be simple. And they have a bit of probably a few kind of mental scars to get over from recent years as well. Mm, they have good players, though, no doubt about it. Yeah. And none better than John Donnelly. He's what a player he is. Uh, we both talked about him a lot. Kenny Ailes, Charlie Carter was deadly in his day in the winter weather. The bearded uh, pirate Raharney are more suited to winter hurling, but it would be a tough game against Castletown Gagan, who play short, quick passes very well. Castletown Gagan will try to neutralise the goal threat like they did to Clonkill. Uh, Joe Murray, off topic, but high catching seems to be gone completely out of the game at Intercounty, as defenders are allowed to pull and drag and not even attempt to go for the ball. Needs to be refereed properly. Do you agree with that? Uh, not sure. Not sure about that. Now, to be honest, which I think defenders are punished an awful lot. I don't think you get away with nearly as much. Like I don't know. If- Tommy Walsh would get away at county level now with what he did back in the day and the classic little classic little push to the back of the helmet all of a sudden you're blind. Like um it's funny, like I often said it before, like if you if, like this is not a foul, like, but if you have your hand in front of the guy's helmet just as the ball is coming down, he can't see the ball. All you need to do is lose sight of the ball for a second. But it's such an art form to be able to do that and still try and catch the ball with your other hand or whatever it is like. So I would say Tommy and JJ definitely had that down to a T. I don't think high catching has gone out of the game though. I just think um, a lot of the time you're not putting puck outs down just on top of lads for the sake of it. Yeah. You're trying to give it a what be it a one on one inside or be it a one on one on the wing. So it might like you're not just lorrying ball down on top of the center back like we would have before. 
Yeah, I do think that the 50-50 ball is going out of the game. Like, So obviously there is room for high catches and there are lads who are unreal at it. Like growing up, would you have been down at the park and there's like, I don't know, eight or nine lads and just the ball is pucked up between everybody and see who can catch it? I mean, yeah. I, I actually wonder, is there a better way to learn catching a high ball than that? It's probably not a better way because you just have to get in among, around amongst the lads. And it's such a, a confidence sapping experience to have a lad go. Oh, it's it's absolutely sickening, yeah. So we would have definitely done that uh, a lot of time growing, a lot of the time growing up. Who did the better finger wag, Sheedy or Dennis Taylor? Look, I'm going to give it to to Sheedy, aren't I? Uh, Jack Fagan, Dermot Burns, great in the high in on the high ball. They certainly are both of those players. Dermot Burns caught some absolute beauties over the course of the season. One of them against Cork, I think over. If I have it right, Robbie O'Flynn, absolutely exceptional. Sean O'Maher says, uh, following on from the last show, best hand passer of a ball. DJ had a bullet, John Troy a wizard, John Flaherty a legend, and big Tony uh, Doran lethal. A hand puck he had instead of hand pass. He was, uh, he was fantastic. Great show. Who do you think is the best hand passer? Do you know what stands out to me before you answer? 2006 under 21 All-Ireland Final replay in Thurles. God, it was so annoying. Uh, Kilkenny got a last second goal to send it to a replay. But at one stage, I'm pretty sure Richie Hogan was standing, I don't know, 45, 65. And he did a hand pass over his head into space for someone. It was absolutely glorious. Yeah, Noel McGrath's hand pass for Lahr for that last goal was brilliant as well. It was that brilliant reverse hand pass where you know there's somebody gone into space. Um, I, DJ was just, yeah, yeah, yeah. That Oh, Jesus, that rots me. <laughs> but... um. What was I going to say to you? DJ's hand pass was so aesthetically good on the eye, like, and mm. it was just the old, the old handball one, the hand really goes. Richie Hogan was very good at it, even though he stopped doing it at county level. I think a lot of people are cutting on to it. I wouldn't be surprised if Brian Cody had a, had a word with him as well, because it could be a bit too flashy and show and showy, maybe. Uh, it probably would be DJ, though. Because it was just 20 or 30 yards and it was just, it was always on the money as well. It was never to the ground. It was always exactly where it should go. And yeah, as no. regards as regards best hands, Tony Dorn just is in a different, is in a different planet to me as regards best hands. And the abuse he took, if you look back at any of the videos, like he's literally being killed and he's still come out with the ball. It's just <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> Ronan Maher, Aaron Galan, couldn't, couldn't say it's gone, to be fair. They're both really good in the air. Aaron Galan is class in the air, it must be said. Nisha Waldron, pucking off the wall between yourself and your brother and compete in the air. Great days. Uh, hurls, uh, hurls, down need to be, hurls down needs to be the rule for that big group in the field. No one able to hurl Sunday with broken fingers otherwise. Yeah, did you have that where you can't go up? And, well, I would say just no one pulling in the air. Obviously, you can use your hurley to sort of manipulate people or whatever and... and protect yourself but obviously yeah, yeah. if you're down in the park a load of like 10 or 12 year olds and everyone's pulling in the air i mean ridiculous no it's madness no no you're allowed to use your heart to protect yourself and kind of jockey into position but not to pull funnily enough i remember uh lester ryan was in ul with me and uh, anyone that knows ul kappa villa is one of the student accommodation places him and it was michael rafter from dixborough and somebody else pat o'neill from the bennett's bridge they just put balls up between it was one lad was poking in between the other two and there was pulling as hard as you like. How there was some broken collarbones, broken hands, I never know. It was it was some breeding ground for hardship, but they were all fairly good in the air as a result of it. Yeah, this is all right. That Joe Canning back hand pass for David Burke in 2011 versus Cork. A bit like Oshin O'Reilly uh, last week for Patrick's Well against, um, again, sorry, against Patrick's Well last week. Two Graham Mulcahy. Uh, I interviewed Graham Mulcahy this week, so check that out in the playlist. But that was called back, even though it was a perfect hand pass. Yeah, Very the the, can, the Canning one though, because he actually he couldn't he could, he wasn't looking at David Burke. It was he was behind him. That was that was beautiful. Sumptuous in, would be the word I'd say. In American football, they'd call it misdirection. Uh, <laughs> actually, George, you mentioned earlier about putting the hand up over someone's helmet as they're trying to go for a high ball. Do you ever see in basketball? Let's say I was kind of like. I was looking to get a three pointer or whatever, and uh, you and I was kind of shaping this way and that, and you know, will I go or will I take the shot on? A lot of the defenders, what they do is they put the hand up in front of your face like that. So the whole idea is just to obscure your view rather than trying to put it up to block the ball per se, which they'll eventually try to do. In the meantime, they'll just try and obscure your view, which is very very interesting. I think that's really good, and even in hurling, like to put your hurl in somebody's way. Like you, you have to always use your. You can never have your hurl down by your side. You have to always be using it 
uh, I think it was, was it Nisha was always saying, about, Nisha said in one of the videos about always having her hurl up. I can't remember what that was about, but it just, any sort of a distraction, it might just catch the eye line or it might take their eye off the post or do something. I'm not talking about just waving a hurl for the sake of it, but you always have to use a hurl where possible. The hurl should always be up. Do you know another thing? You know when you're, um, when an opposition team has a free and you'll always have a defender standing, you know, the 10 yards back or whatever far, far back that the ref makes them go, hold the hurley up. And, you know, you can't wave the hurley. It'll be a free. You can't let her roar. So you might just say as they're, you know, they're lining up straight over the, the black spot. Yeah. You know, obviously you want to try and jinx the player. But I, over the years, what I always did is rather than standing right dead center and putting the hurley up to give them a target to aim at, you're actually guiding the free. I'd always stand off to the side and put the hurley up in the hope that it's a distraction and they hit it in the general direction of my hurley, which is actually going slightly wide. And I feel like it worked once or twice. <laughs> I'd be the same. I would stand directly in the middle, but rather than holding the hurl up here, my right hand would be off out to the right. So I'd have my hurl up Same there. Idea. Yeah. yeah. The, the only thing uh, I often worried about was, is that if it did hit off my hurl, because I only had one hand and it was off out here, would I have enough power to actually take much off the shot if it did hit? Whereas well, if you, you have wouldn't. it here, yeah, I wouldn't. Sorry, yeah, of course. Yeah. But if you have it here, you have full control. If you have it out here, you have less control. But yeah, I always kind of held it out and just thought, if they're following my hurl here, it's going towards the right post and there's definitely less chance of it uh, of it going over. Nisha says, yeah, hurl up, hurl up. It's to track the flight of the slitter. Think back to the 2014 replay final. How many times did Kilkenny block tip, but after the ball was struck, active hurl. Yeah, so interesting point there. That's the distance block. The distance block to me is one of the best skills in hurling. And there's only, I can only name a couple of lads. Barry Harden in my own club is unbelievable lad. Somebody gets away the strike and the hurl is off up here. And the ball is in flight, five yards in flight, and the hurl is in position where he thinks it's gone. The amount of times he's able to get a block in that position is unbelievable. Some people are just gifted at some sort of certain skills, and that's a really good one. I like that one because the player thinks the ball has been delivered and they've hit it exactly as they wanted to, and it's away, and then all of a sudden it's blocked. Declan O'Keefe says, in 90s Limerick trainer, manager Tom Ryan insisted that Joe Quaid put the ball down between Sean O'Neill and Mike Hoolan, who were trying to take each other's heads <laughs> off under the dropping ball. Uh, that is Dick says, uh, that is sick. Who do you think will win the, between Rhinas and uh, Kilcormick Kalahi? I mean, it's a bit away yet, but if you want to have an early sort of a look at it. Uh, uh, difficult. It's interesting to see how Rhinas react to us beating them as comprehensively as we did and whether it's... Uh, the kind of the shock that they that they needed. Uh, well, I won't call those two awfully semi-finals until next week. Just need to know a bit more injury-wise and fitness-wise. But I think to be two interesting semi-finals. Um, Nisha says Noel Connors was unreal at it. He was sickening to mark. Uh, Nisha played down with Bally Gunner for a while, so I'm presuming they came up against Passage. Yeah, that's the long. Hurt. He was actually very good at that. He always got his hurl in. The forward might get the shot away. Um, it's actually more demoralizing, I'd say than the block right in front of your face because you think you have the ball gone and then all of a sudden it stopped. And yeah. it's less likely when you block somebody down right in front of them, how many times, and this is a real sickener, when you block them down that well that it falls straight back to them and they put the ball over the bar, whereas with the distance block, the ball is gone and it's far more likely to drop around your feet than around the forward's feet. Yeah, I remember playing against Jude one time and uh, there was a lad, about, I think I, I must have been marking him obviously, he went to strike a ball over from maybe the 65, and I didn't think I had a hope of getting it, but I did one of those lunges at it. So I dived through the air type <laughs> thing out to the side. Couldn't believe that it struck my hurley. You know, I thought it was a great lad. And sure, like I was on the ground, and he just picked up the ball and threw it over. Very yeah, it's the same, exactly yeah. what you're saying, basically. You over you overcommitted. You got the dream block, but the, it's sicker when the ball falls back to the, the lad, and it makes it even more easy for them. But the, the, the thing is, after the game, all anyone remembers is the initial block. A bit like if you make a great catch, which obviously you would never have done. Even if you lost the ball straight away after it, all people would remember is the catch. Funny story. We played Valley Hale in a practice game before the 2013 final, and I was coming back, actually, the stress fracture in my leg, and I played centre forward. I was playing centre forward. And it was brutal. We played three 20 minutes. It was brutal in the first 20 minutes. And then the second 20 minutes, uh, I was marking TJ, and I actually scored one three off TJ and caught a ball over him at the edge of the square. My no God. one remembers it. Nobody, only me, nobody remembers it because we got. I think we got well beaten in the game. But I actually caught a ball. Do you know the way 
uh, the ball just came in and it was so advantageous for me. And I think it just pushed him out of the way like that and tapped it into net. But I'm literally the only one that remembers it. <laughs> Very unfair idea. Uh, let's talk about uh, Davy Fitz. He was in the, the media this week and obviously answered a few questions. I think you have a couple of quotes there. He was talking about uh, the situation with Brian Lohan. He was talking about what Henry Shefflin is coming up. He might read out a couple of the quotes. Yeah, just a couple of interesting quotes. Um, he just This was a, a Davy Fitzgerald quote on trying to make peace with Brian Lohan. He said, I held out an olive branch. He didn't want to take it after the Wexford game. That's the way it is. I can't do any more. I don't have any interest in fighting. I really don't. There's a lot more stuff going on in life. There are people out there with serious serious illnesses. That's something to worry about, isn't it? We shouldn't be fighting and messing. We all have our opinions, but we should be able to get over them. That's the way I see things. Um, yeah, I don't know about extending an olive branch in uh, just at the end of a championship game i think it's something they need to do behind closed doors and it's not something that there needs to be cameras around for they just need to if they're going to sort out their differences they need to do it behind closed doors in my opinion yeah i, I probably don't have much more to add to that yeah it's it's something that doesn't need to happen in the limelight i mean you've seen it at soccer you know at the at the top level that's come out shake hands get over it uh, and you move on not everything has to be one of these things that's aired out publicly all the time. So I agree with you on that. It's probably something that doesn't need to be in the public domain at all either. You'd be probably better off saying no comment rather than saying, like, it, from what Davy is saying here now is is that Brian Lohan didn't want to make peace, and he did. And we don't know 100% whether you'd have to get Brian Lohan's comment on that. Yeah, yeah. And, like, Brian Lohan doesn't really do media interviews. So, you know, that's... That, whereas Davy's obviously he's promoting the, the Fifth Family show that's coming out again, so... You, of course, are going to have media duties, so he's out for it. He's going to get asked the question. But either way, yeah, it's, yeah. Do you know what? It's a bit tiresome to me at this stage. And I'm not saying, I'm just saying the narrative is, is tiresome, not any one particular person. Uh, ah, yeah. No, I'd, I'd agree with you. Yeah, there was just a, another interesting quote here. Davey was obviously um, pipped for the Galway job by Henry Shefflin, and he was just uh, he was asked his opinion on the difference between club and intercounty management. And he just said, chalk and cheese, I'm with my own club. I've been coach and manager with different clubs, and club is really special. It's really special to do it with your own. It's great. But there's a massive difference between that and the county. There's a lot more pressure anyway, I can tell you that, a lot more scrutiny. It'll be different. Henry will find it a, a bit of a difference coming from being a pundit in RTE to actually being on the side lane and having something to tr something you're trying to do instead of looking at it on TV. You've got to make those moves. You've got to you've got to do those things. And with all due respect to clubs, there is an Atlantic Ocean of a difference. That's my opinion and my view. Um, there there is there is a massive difference between the two of them. Uh, scrutiny would be. The one, it's probably the, the main thing, and you're you're going to be in the media the whole time. People are going to be analysing what you're doing, particularly Henry, because he's, as I said, widely acknowledged as one of the greatest players of all time, if not the greatest. So every move he makes, if Galway lose their first two league games, it'll be like, you know, is inter-county too much for King Henry? You know, that, these are all the things you're going to hear over, over the next while, and every move he makes will be analysed. Did you get a sense of like a, a sense of chippiness in those quotes? So I haven't heard him say it in the spoken voice. So he might have said it in a very cool, calm, you know, sort of disaffected sort of way. Or, but it comes back to the row of 2017 that I think about. You know, after the Watford Wexford game, and you know that um, that Henry Shefflin and Dignan had tweeted about the standard affair and the type of hurling that was played. And Joe you know, Davy came out then and says, I think Michael Dignan and Henry have had a goal. Let me say this straight out: Michael Dignan. And Henry have never managed any team at a high level. The people need to wake up, so they do. And then, you know, towards the end, it was, I think RT should go and have a look at themselves and get analysts who've been on the sideline and who know what the story is about. That's how I feel strong, uh, easy to knock people. I like to see their track records when it comes to it, when it comes to managing. It's a lot different to playing, I can tell you. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting anyway. Yeah, it's definitely interesting comments anyway. Um, there is a massive difference between club and county. There's a massive difference between sitting on the pundit's chair and uh, and standing on the sideline as well. So Henry will definitely have that to prove, all right. But like, it's kind of a natural progression for him. Fair enough, he mightn't be that particularly experienced at county level or he might not have much experience even at club level. But he's going to have to try to swim at some stage. So it's going to be interesting to see. It is a, a big departure from standing in the studio, looking at things... And seeing what should happen to being on the sideline, and do you actually see what should happen? And can you look at it, you know, with a sim with similar eyes than you would as a pundit? But it's going to be fascinating, definitely fascinating for us anyway. Um, and it light it lights up the Leinster Championship as well. 
Yeah, like you know when we're at Croke Park in the in the press box and you've got that beautiful view from like the the, the high tier and the and the Hogan stand. You're down at the bottom end. I just think it's such a brilliant position to be watching the game from. The same with Semple Stadium. You know, if you're up in the the gantry, the the high gantry there, you just such a beautiful view of it. But also in a dispassionate way, you can look around the field and you can sort of analyze. Okay, where are the holes? Well, you don't have to worry about the ten different issues that a manager like you know Davy Fitz or what Henry is going to be up against next year, where you're, you have to worry about. Is that cornerback, you know, is that injury going to hold up? Uh, is our sweeper doing the job that we asked of him? You know, can we get messages out? Do I tell this lad to warm up? You know, all those things that we never have to think about. Would you be able to think as clearly if you had everything else to worry about? Hard to know. And it's, I, I don't think you would. And depends what type of a person you are as well. Like if you're uh, a Jim Gavin, who just seemed to be at this kind of, it's almost like he's got this Zen thing going on during a match. And maybe it's a bit of an act, I, I don't know. But it seems like he's never panicked or never rushed. And maybe that aids his decision-making a lot. But then you have someone like Aleem Sheedy, who's all action, all action, motivating lads, trying to motivate himself as well. So it depends. Like I wonder like with someone like Sheedy, how much does he see on match day? Or is he letting other people see for him, if you know what I mean? Is he thinking that my best, one of my best attributes is passion and riling lads up? I let an Eamon O'Shea, I let my man in the sky look at those things a bit closer because I can only see a certain amount from down here. I think the assistance that you have on match day is massive. Um, I know if I was ever managing to, at any sort of a level, I'd have someone I really respect up very, very high looking at things and feeding their view on things from a different height and a different angle back to me because there's no way I can see everything from down there. Yeah, I'd imagine it's a case of the different um, people you have on the sideline, which, and obviously we know at the moment, like the problem with getting, you know, Mayor Furnas out on the pitch and what have you, but you'd have someone looking after the backs, someone looking after the midfielders, someone looking after the forwards who'd probably double up as water carriers or hurley holders, you know, in either, in either code. Um, and that's certainly the way we did it under Matty Kenny. And, um, you know, actually there was a point there about, you know, Matty jumped up from club, obviously with Kula and then up to Intercounty. And like, can't Henry just do that? And obviously he's with Galway where more success would be, you know, people would be looking for more success because of their history. But like he, Matty would have previously been involved with Galway senior teams yeah. and Galway under 21 teams. So for, for Henry, there is that kind of, um, there is that question that remains to be answered. Again, repeating what we said last week, we do, you and I both see, uh, suspect that he will be a success here. So that'd be interesting to see, but um Richie O'Neill as well is coach, to the best of my knowledge, has him you know, coached at senior level, senior county level. So then the other personnel, particularly the Galway personnel, like I know Johnny Kelly's with Offaly, thankfully, well, I'm fairly sure he is, but somebody like that, they need those type of experienced people as the other members of their backroom team. I think they need people who have experienced, maybe, who can bring that kind of uh, inter-county experience to the table, the experience that maybe Henry and Richie O'Neill don't have and kind of fill in those gaps for them. And a comment in here from Thomas Gallagher says, uh, Gavin heads up the Irish Aviation Authority and was in the Air Corps. So he brought that thinking through to his management. Yeah, it certainly seemed to do that. Very regimented sort of style. I uh, love listening to Jim Gavin talking. Um, doing, and he's done a few different podcasts. He did one with, with um, Ted Furman that used to play with, uh, play with Ballymun and played under 21. With him. He's really, actually really interesting and engaging to listen to when he's not all talking about football i love hearing about his um his career and kind of i think he just yeah he probably trained himself to have that mentality to be really cool at all times because probably his job requires it as well is the galway team gone stale as talaman ga i wouldn't have said i wouldn't have said it after this year's league but after this year's championship you'd probably say um somebody can henry can come in now and can basically shape it in any way he wants he can move anyone anywhere he likes. He can clean and, house if he likes. Yeah, basically, yeah. Maybe. That's what Anthony Cunningham did when he went in, and obviously they got to a final then the following year. Like he cleaned house. Yeah, me all done who did it to some extent in his second year as well. There was a good few kind of retirements that year as well. Um, so yeah, it'd be interesting to see the conversation that they're having behind closed doors now. Like yeah, you just you would be fascinated to see whether it's a WhatsApp group or whatever the calls like do you think X, Y, and Z is up to it? This X, Y, and Z hasn't played well for the last couple of years. Should he be given another chance under us? Like, So it's going to be fascinating to see. 
yeah, get your comments in there. Let us know who, who you are, where you're watching from. Obviously, we had uh, a load of different people commenting. When I was speaking with uh, Nikki Brennan there last week, we had someone from Mongolia who was watching live. So let us know. We had Salu the other day. Uh, we obviously have the lads in Keown Craig over in Scotland. So let us know where you're watching from. Talaman says, uh, fine to be zen when you're up by 29 points in most games. That is true, actually. Yeah, but Jeezy was fair relaxed when they were, you know, been beaten a pint by Mayo with four or five minutes to go. His demeanour didn't change. It's mm. it's phenomenal, really. Um, I think I, I think that, def that type of thing, it was a thing that probably passed over to the players as well. There was no panic on the pitch, in fairness to the dubs, regardless of how bad a situation they were in. Like, remember, Tyrone were dominating at the start of the 18 All-Ireland Final. And it was just like, you know, there was no panic. You would see a lot of teams panic. You would see it in lads' uh, body language even, that they panic, that they would panic. But I think it was definitely something that they practised a lot. Um, and it made sure that they were always kind of playing to their optimum. I mean, even, if, even if they weren't playing well, they always believed that, you know, a team panics at the end and they're like trying to force things to happen. And it rarely happens. When you just stay playing natural, that's when things can kind of happen. You can get back into a game and it's not going well for you. Yeah, they definitely forced it this year in yeah. the they lost against Mayo. You'd also say that in 2014, they sort of forced it against Donegal, the, the last championship defeat that Jim Gavin had. Uh, watching from Des Moines, Iowa, says uh, Liam McHugh. Interesting, yeah. Let us know where else you're watching from. Get the comments Liam in. McHugh, uh, I don't know much about Iowa, but I know the wrestler Seth Rollins is from Davenport, Iowa. Let me know if that's anywhere close to you and if he's a folk hero in Iowa. Uh, De Beard the Pirate, Davey is uh, Jose Mourinho-esque. He brings his style and us versus them mentality. And he asks so much, he can't stay for too long. But I do think he's underrated now because of this. Yeah, it is interesting now because, like, obviously he's always been rated uh, highly enough. But, like, is the folks the last couple of years and maybe some of the negative stories around, you know, like the whole covid wexford Clare situation last year to what's happening with Cahar Lohan and, you know, with his family and Pat Fitzgerald and, and the Clare County Board and all that kind of stuff. And then obviously the performances the last two years at Wicklow have been pretty substandard. You know, has it gone full circle now and he's actually kind of rated more lower than he should be? Uh, probably. Like, in fairness to him, um, he's gotten results and titles, the three counties he's been with. The thing, the, the difference that Galway would have been is there would have been massive expectation in Galway. There was a massive expectation when he came into Waterford mid-season after being uh, after being beaten in the Munster Championship. There wasn't that massive expectation in Clare, even though they'd won their first... Uh, no, they hadn't won any under-21 all Ireland before he came in. And there was no expectation in Wexford as well. There would have been expectation in Galway, so it would have been different. I think he's very, very good at taking a county that has drifted a good bit off the radar and flying them back up. And maybe then they might drop or kind of flat line thereafter stay at a certain kind of a grass but Galway would have been expectations would have been high from the start because they've won all Ireland only four years ago but I, I don't think what he's done should be in any way underplayed he's won an all Ireland with a non-traditional county in Clare um, and he's only the what is he only the third third manager to do that outside of Gerlach Nan and whoever was over them back in 1914 he won a Munster title uh, with probably an ageing Waterford team in 2010 and he won a Leinster title with Wexford in 2019. Two or three years previous, you probably couldn't have envisaged that happening in Wexford. I'd love to know if Clare people have the, had their ears pricked up when you said a non-traditional Hurling County there. Non-traditionally successful, would say. Yeah, I, what I mean is, like, it's, he's, it wasn't with one of the big three. Do you know what I mean? Clare have, was it just, was it 1914, 95, 97? Is that, was that just, it was 2013, just their fourth All-Ireland. I could be stand to be yeah. corrected on that. So, yeah. like, that's a huge achievement. That's, a, that's what you always say about Paul Canurk. Uh, that title with Clare is massive. And for him to have coached three more All-Irelands with, you know, a team outside of the big three. He's won four All-Irelands with teams outside of the big three, which is huge. When does it stop being the big three? So yeah. how, many do, how many do Limerick need to win for us to stop talking about a big three? Well, I think you're always going to talk about the big three because if you go to the role of honour, Kilkenny have 30-something, Tip have 30-something, and Cork have 30-something as well, don't they? Or, so, like, so they're going to have 100 All-Irelands roughly between them. Yeah, no, no, that is true. But like, how many do, the, do Limerick need to get up to? They've won nine now. Yeah, uh, honestly, like, I, I think they're always going to be referred to as the big three until someone uh, gets in around that kind of territory. And sure, that could take 
that could take lifetimes to get in around that territory. And it's not as if Kilkenny, Tip and Cork aren't going to win them at different stages over the next while as well. It's just that it's more historical really than anything else. Yeah, no, it certainly is. And just look at it, 36 titles for Kilkenny, 30 for Cork, 28 for Tip, Limerick 10, sorry, they're on 10. Uh, Dublin and Wexford have six, Galway have five. Interesting, like, you know, because you'd consider them more traditional than some other counties that are maybe ahead of them there, but no, they've only just five All-Irelands. Offaly and Clare next. The, yeah, so Clare have four. Watford have a couple. I mean, there again, Watford, we consider them pretty traditional, but I suppose a lot of their history too has been not very successful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad I didn't undersell Clare too much. It didn't hurt to Clare people too much because I don't want that. We've had enough. Well, you've had more hardship now than I've had. Than I've had. I, th- I feel I've made up with Clare people uh, in the main. Watching from the West Midlands in England, originally from Adair, says Declan O'Keefe. Yeah, just keep letting us know where you're from. We do uh, and where you're watching from. Watching from Mallow in Cork. Listen, th- live in Thurless. Uh, I was certain before walking out my front door last Friday and there was Lara with an old lad t- uh, talking his ear off. Still haven't spotted Una Healy, mind. Are they professional last Talaman GA? Look at how they blitz team in the last 10 minutes. All of S&C coaches, that are they're all doping. Ah, don't be saying that, uh, Talo GA, man. We certainly don't believe that there's any doping from, from any players. Uh, Wexford, not Wicklow, says Red Lad. Yeah, you, you, said, you said Davey was over Wicklow. But, uh, uh, oh, that no, would have no, been good crack. I would have been on board for that now. Yeah. Talaman, where, uh, where the Clare four uh, were clear with the 421 all Ireland's totally underachieving, or was Conor Ryan lost that big? He was definitely a massive loss. Obviously, he had an ailment that uh, meant he had to retire very, very early. And we didn't get to see. I mean, he was unbelievable in 2013. We would love to have seen that for a little bit longer. Obviously, that didn't work out. Um, did Clare underachieve? Probably. I mean, they wouldn't sit. Like, during Davies' era, 60% of their championship wins were in 2013 alone. So, obviously, they just didn't win enough games over his five or six-year tenure. So, yeah, they, yeah, they probably did. Yeah, they achieved more, a lot more than the Limerick team that did three in a row at the start of the 2000s anyway. Um, I just think it would have been interesting if that Clare All-Ireland hadn't come in 2013. Just say they'd won the three, the three All-Irelands, 12, 13, 14. And then they'd won their senior All-Ireland in 15 or 16. You know, there was an awful lot coming at a very, very young age. Mm. Uh, Liam McHugh says, Davenport, hour and a half east of me on the Mississippi River. That's the job. Good to know. Yeah, Mayo had plenty of chances to beat Dublin if they had if they're so professional. Uh, Mayo had a panel of thirty and another fifteen developing players. Uh, Kildare and Mead. Uh, let me just see Kildare and Mead only have themselves to blame for being so poor. Uh, the big tree is gone. They're knocking it down to make apartments, says uh, Sean O'Sullivan. <laughs> uh, tip or two or three offers. Yep, as I pointed out. Let me just see. Uh, cheers for the shout out, lads. Much appreciated. Hashtag Crown Craig uh, Abu. Too many of Clare's important forwards got phys- physically wrecked. That's why they fell off so dramatically. Um, if Dave has uh, Davy has to go anywhere, where do you think he would do well? Thinking Westmead, Leash or Clare could possibly do a great job taking a team at that level and maybe causing enough, uh, maybe causing an upset. Clare were good enough to win at least two more after 2013 says SSRI, but obviously they just didn't do it. I mean, they didn't win a monster either. So they won a league in 2016, but other than that, it was very, very disappointing. But if you look at it, Jane, after 2013, right, Kilkenny obviously bounced back, um, having been beaten in 13. 15 was, you know, a poor All-Ireland and probably the worst Kilkenny team, or the, you could say the worst Kilkenny team that Cody won in All-Ireland with. So, like, to me, in many ways, that was his best All-Ireland. 16, obviously, tipped produced a big performance 17 uh galway who obviously only won the one then you have 18 limerick who won one there was probably a couple of years there where if claire were going to win a second one the opportunity was there probably 18 was you know a, probably a really really good chance but there was you know five years to get back to crow park after 2013 just far too long and if they had to win that semi-final against Galway in 18, they were up against a Limerick team that they'd beaten by 11 points in Munster earlier yeah. that season. Would yeah. we have seen the, the Limerick juggernaut since? Actually, Niall Heffernan says, Limerick learned from the failure of the three under-21 teams from the 2000s. Making sure the talent comes through and have all they need to be successful is what's different about Limerick now. Shall we jump on to the Clare County Championship? The semi-finals are on this weekend. Ballier, we're going to be without Tony Kelly. He got surgery, and uh, as far as I know, he's in a boot. He's going to be gone for the foreseeable future. Ballier up against Newmarket and Fergus, and the other semi-final, really tasty, Ina Kilnamona against Aero Guinness. I'm sure a lot of people saw Ina Kilnamona beat Cratlow on TV just a couple of weeks ago. That was an excellent game. 
But starting off with Ballier against uh, Newmarket on Fergus, I think Con- Con- Colin Ryan, uh, he's been he's been doing pretty well this year again. Obviously, 2013, high, I think highest championship scorer in one season at the time and didn't get an all-star for it, which I thought mm. was very harsh. Yeah, that was mad. Good to see that he's um that he's still going strong with his club. These lads obviously disappear maybe off the national radar when they finish up with their county, but he's still going strong. What is it, eight years after winning All Ireland? Um, he's a, he was a brilliant player underage. I remember he killed us when we played Flannins in the college and semi final. He killed us before. Uh, really, really good player. Um, the interesting thing I just thought, oh, I want you to pick your brain on this. Valier without Tony Kelly, obviously we got them over the line the last day. Like if you were to put a number on what Tony Kelly is worth to Ballier. I'll put it to you this way. How many points worse off do you think Ballier are without him, if you could put a figure on it? I, I have kind of have something in my head. What would it be for you? If you are to say they're starting minus something because Tony Kelly is not playing, what would it be? Oh, there's probably five or six points, really. <laughs> yeah, that, kind of, that was kind of what I was thinking, yeah. Five or six, and that's, that's a lot. Like that, Can we come on and take him out of it the last day? You know, yeah. Because they were, they were struggling. He obviously wasn't right with the ankles, having to get the ankle surgery. He came on against Kilmele and it kind of helped change the game. Like if you run through their championship this year, they beat Broadford. They, yeah, they beat Broadford the first day out. Then they set off Crosheen pretty handily. Then they drew with Cratlow. Then later on beat Kilmele 17 points to 16. Now Newmarket and Fergus looking at their group let me just see where how they did in their group they topped the group with Aero Guinness Fecal and Clooney Quinn which you know is, is no mean feat either but yeah I, I'd be tending to agree with you because like I know they've got the likes of Niall DC to hit freeze but like it's great to have Tony Kelly there and just the, the speed he has the, the, the other team doesn't have to plan half as much about you they can nearly be making as many plans for what they're going to do because they know that Tony Kelly won't be on the field and they'll be thinking if we can tie down Niall DC or maybe Gary Brennan if he's out around the middle field. If we can tie down either of these two, we have a massive chance of winning. Whereas, you know, potentially they could tie down Tony Kelly to some extent. He could still end up with three or four points and it would release Niall DC or Gary Brennan or whoever to excel. So I think it would be different for Ballier if they'd won the quarter final without Kelly and had that, you know, we can, be, we can win a knockout game without him. Whereas coming into this game, he's obviously not going to feature in this game at all. Uh, it makes it very in, in, intriguing. Like they could, they could still potentially get to a final. Um, it's, it's a tough game to call. Like, like Ballier still have loads of class all over the pitch. Still have Jack Brown probably at the spine of their defence. Still going to have Paul Flanagan probably at the edge of the square as well. Like still lo- lots of lots of big names that can carry them through. Obviously mix, missing the biggest name, but like if you were to say. Ballier and Newmarket were meeting in a semi-final at the start of the year. You'd probably be fancying Ballier to come through. The caveat, obviously, is that they're going to be missing their best player. So uh, it makes it a difficult game to call. Yeah, uh, Paul Flanagan has obviously really established himself this year with Clare. He's going to be an important player. Might be matched up with Colin Gilfoyle. In the Barrett, he'll probably be centre-back for Newmarket. Another one of those stalwarts who would have won an under-21 All-Ireland back in 2009. Probably in and out of the panel. Uh, James McInerney, he's still playing with them. Might match up with Niall DC. Uh, memory of James McInerney, obviously a good full-back. Was it a red card against Galway in 2011, 2012? Might have been either the start of Davies' tenure or the end of Sparrows. Rings a bell. I think he won a puck for you know. Um, he was playing for Flannins that day in 2004, uh, 2005 when we played them in Nina, actually. Um, I'll just say about that as well. It's a Nina great venue for those kind of tighter kind of... Like, it's real. You're re- they're real in on top of you. I just yeah. love that. I love it even for league games. We play tip. Yeah. They said it as Nina. Yeah, Nana. McDonough Park, isn't it? McDonough yeah, Park. Like Nana. Nana, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, McInerney be, must be 34, 35 as well. So the age profile uh, of some of their big men, uh, McInerney and the Barrett and Colin Ryan, would be mid mid to late thirties anyway. Some of them would be. So Ballier be a lot younger. Niall DC wouldn't be wouldn't be anything like that. Nor would Flanagan or Jack Brown or Gary Brennan be about thirty two as well. I probably still would be fancying Ballier just to come through. Yeah, I actually I agree, and I think the winner is going to come from the other semi final, the overall winner, Ina Kilnamona. I mean, they were very good against Cratlow once they kind of absorbed the early uh, storm from Cratlow and Podge Collins obviously hit the crossbar, came out and Josh Geiler scored a goal up the other end. He ended up with 1-4, I think. Aidan McCarthy, he is a sort of a free role to some degree. His brother Jason, really, really good at centre-back. And then Davy Fitz, 
Fitzgerald is arguably the player, club player of the year on form at the moment. There's one or two others that would be in there, but um, they have a lot of threats. So there's going to be pressure on the likes of Liam Corey, Aaron Fitz. Danny Russell is going to need to come up with a few scores. Shane O'Donnell is hopefully at 100% and David Reedy. So you can see we've named a lot of players there. There's a lot of quality on show in the semi-final. Yeah, no, that's a quality semi-final. Definitely the pick of the two, you would say, anyway. Um, Aerog, I think, are already in a football final. They have a load of, uh, they have a load of guys playing duel. Um, Gavin Cooney, uh, David Reedy be playing as well. Just see David, imagine Mark and David, David Reedy in a football field. It'd be an absolute nightmare. Just buzz, buzzing around everywhere. Um it's good to see uh, O'Donnell, O'Donnell back 100% fit and he's probably absolutely mad for road as well, um, having missed so much of the year. Um, so he's probably like he's probably fresher than he would normally be coming into a club season, which means Aerog might get a bounce from that maybe that they wouldn't normally where he could be coming in fatigued from a county season. Fascinating game. Um, David, David Fitzgerald is an interesting one as well. Uh, tends to like can kind of play that kind of looser kind of floating role as well. He's a sort of player that you just can't let float around and pick up a load of ball because he can hurt you. He'll he'll pick if he's not marked tight, probably with someone tracking him closely, he'll be going running off the shoulder guys the whole time. And once he's in that position uh, and it's built up ahead of steam, you won't be stopping him. So you need a kind of a bit of a misery guts to be picking him up and stopping him from making those runs, checking him um, and not letting him get into the game because if he gets into the game like he did the last day Ennis will be in a, in a bit of trouble but uh, I like Aerog in this game I have to say um, they've been they've been they've really pushed put up to six point bridge the last couple of years we're probably unlucky last year I think there's only a point in it they really put them to the sword last day and I know uh, the bridge were missing a couple of lads and maybe Cottle Malone and uh and Jamie Shannon were just back having missed a bit of time but they really put to, to put them to the sword impressively you'd have to say I am just about going with Ina Kilnamona here, and maybe that's because I saw them on TV and, you know, I can see the threat of Aidan McCarthy, who I think can become one of the top players in Ireland, assuming that Clare continue to kick on under Brian Lohan. Um, and I look at Davy Fitz, and I, I think sometimes with his pace, the fact that he's hurling now, he's, he's a little bit inconsistent, and he's in and out of the Clare team. But, like, sometimes he does stuff, and I'm like, geez, that's a bit Austin Gleeson-ish, isn't it? I'm not saying yeah. he has the same natural flicks and all the tricks and all that kind of stuff. He's got the gotcha of him at times, definitely, at yeah. At times, yeah. 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 It's, so, uh, like, that that's a, a very uh, high compliment. But I think there's so much more you could get out of him. And if you got in McCarthy and Davy Fitz and keep Tony Kelly flying for the next few years and Shane O'Donnell starts uh, next season like he would have played in years gone by and Peter Duggan hits the ground running, Says you wouldn't be feeling too. Uh, you wouldn't be poor Mountain Clare next year. No, I. They're the potential bolter next year. You'd have to say they're the team that could not could not. They wouldn't be coming from nowhere. They'd be coming from you know they've as you said they've an awful lot of really good players. You get Peter Duggan back involved as well, maybe too. Um, get just it's a big thing is just making sure that Tony Kelly is fit. Um, come championship time next year, and it looks like he's made a decision that will make sure that he is in good shape and that he's not going to be hobbling around and uh, Ballier going on a club run and him being, you know, risking uh, the possibility of missing championship next year. I'd be uh, quietly confident. The fact that the loan decision was over the line quite soon and even, you know, the development plan or the, you know, the strategic plan that was put in place in Clare definitely looks like things are starting to move a bit there. Now, there's probably a lot of other things need to happen in order for them to reach their potential on and off the pitch. But there's definitely signs would suggest that at least the wheel is turning anyway. Yeah, ST says, would love to see Davy take on Westmead. There's been a serious improvement in the standard of hurling in Westmead over the last decade. It's a county in need of taking the next step. But Joe Fortune has been appointed as manager, so he deserves every chance there, and hopefully he has a good tenure. Flew Declan under the radar a bit, Shane, didn't it? Joe Fortune's bit, yeah. one, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Declan O'Keefe says, fair signal for Ballier to lose Kelly. For Clare, he's up to a 10-point loss in scores and assists. For Ballier, he's probably a 15-point loss. So he's obviously uh, saying he's even more important than we're suggesting. But it, it, and if you were to talk about games like that Bunster game against Turles a few years back, then you'd be saying, okay, yeah, maybe he is worth up to that much. Yeah, I suppose a lot of it is I'm thinking, you know, uh, sometimes it can be masked with maybe, you know, freeze that he's taken or that. I'm just trying, you know, I'm thinking, you know, he's going to get three or four from play. He's going to win at least a handful of freeze as well. I think five or six is a decent. If Ballier are able to get to a county final without him, uh, it'd, be so, it'd be a fair statement. And it'd be hard beaten in a final if they've gotten that far without him. Yeah, a reminder, please do subscribe to the channel and subscribe to all the social channels too, please. Press the button in the bottom right hand corner if you're watching YouTube. We got over the 9,000 recently, looking to get over the 10,000, that would be great. 
Also, uh, if you want to sponsor or follow us on patreon.com forward slash our game five a month, get all the audio podcasts, really good way to support the channel. So I'd absolutely appreciate that. Now, we're going to go on to the Dublin uh, Hurling Championship. But first off, we had an episode of Copycats out this week. First one in a while, myself and Nisha Waldron, who will be talking out for Cooler this weekend, the Kilkenny man, originally from St. Lactans. So here's the old video, and let us know what you think. We'll be back in a couple of minutes after this. There's been some savage sideline cuts scored over the years, right? But off the top of our heads, we were thinking, former club mate of Shane's, uh, Jerry Kelly from Boris Lee, against a former club team of mine, Bally Gunner, in the Munster final, inside the 14-yard line, on the right hand side to be able to cut the ball with darts. It's unreal. Yeah, because it arcs away from goal. It couldn't be a tighter angle. We're going to give it five attempts each. You're the sideline specialist. And there's the little doggy. Yeah. Mind games from the doggy. Ooh. Ridiculous. Was that just wide? That was very close. I don't know. He's, he's immediately got his range. That's very worrying. Not a great start, but predictable. Ah. Ooh, okay. Maybe he'll keep getting worse. Oh, just not getting it. You see, you're trying to be so exact and catch it so perfectly, you're actually making it. Oh, you're giving yourself no chance. Oh, Ooh, unlucky. Shane, fair hipper Dorin. <laughs> Oh, great. Do you actually stop putting so much pressure to absolutely blast the ball yeah. and stop thinking about getting it between the two posts, just connect? Oh, it's there! Oh, it's there! Oh, it's oh, there! Oh, that is <laughs> unbelievable! Let me shake the hand of the man. Like, I'm not going to get That is unbelievable. You won't get nothing from me knowing that technique. <laughs> you won't get nothing from me. Oh, it was on target and all, you clown! <laughs> just to put the seal on it. Tell them again about the time I scored three in one game. No, he's never scored one before. This is a pure fluke. Still want to see the video of the first one. Oh! <laughs> uh, so one last chance to equalize. Let's see, can he get it? Shaggling Shane. Far Vorosali. Traharla Paddy. Can I hear you, Yesh? Shaston, son. <laughs> will you shut up? Will you take it, will you? <laughs> no, no pressure. <laughs> oh, no! Oh! oh boy! <laughs> yes! <laughs> ah, well, what can you do? Nisha with the W there. 1 0. I'm happy enough I got better as we went along, but unbelievable attempts. Send in your efforts. Yeah, to be fair, I thought for a second. That last one was going over. And I didn't realise until I watched the video back that the first one was over the bar from Nisha. So he was 2 nil up. But, you know, I was there thinking, we're going for extra time here. We're going for sudden death. <laughs> your, te your technique is all over the place. Well, the, you can see Nisha's been practising since he was young. Lad, whereas I'm, I'm just rocking up thinking, sure, I'll cut that over the bar. And every <laughs> effort is there. Yeah, there's no rhythm to what I'm doing. It's a very, it's a very, very difficult skill unless you you have to have put an awful lot of time into it. Uh, Joe Canning said that he wouldn't practice sidelines in recent years at all. It was more of a legacy thing that he'd put that much time into it during his teens that you were just topping up nearly the whole time. So that just anybody for for coaching while he's acting like that, the amount, the amount, what you do particularly, um, I would say from about. 14 to 19 or 20 or even just to, when you finish college that will literally most of that will carry you through your senior career you've done a lot of the practice you just need to keep topping up then over time i'd say the same for reading and having a broad vocabulary if you do that when you were young it will always stand to you i, I have a big uh, big b in my bonnet over that one noel richard hogan are you using a t did you not see some of my sidelines there's no <laughs> way i was using the t um Let's see, Shane Power. Afternoon, lads. Monday I was watching in Salou, and today I'm watching in work. A sad, drastic change of venue, but good to see you and keep up the great coverage as always. Appreciate it, Shane, and uh, good to have you commenting again. Oh, Shane, back in work, <laughs> back in work after lovely Salou on Monday. Like that's oh man, it is tough to take. Let's At least on. he was away on a holiday, though. Do you know what I mean? I always say, um, just before after COVID hit and all that kind of crack, I'd gone away on a couple of big holidays before that. And thank God I did, because at least you're like, 
oh, geez, remember the crack I had in that casino here? Or just remember that night when, you know, we were out till all hours? At least you had like a something you could, you know, remember a happy little thing. And at least he's like, I'm sure he's golden brown sitting at work now at the moment. And at least, you know, he's not pale as whatever as me and you are. <laughs> okay, the Dublin Hurling Championship this weekend. It's semi final stage, just like with Tip and Claire. And Claire. Kula versus Kilmacud Croaks. Quiet, um, quiet for a second now. Kula versus Kilmacud Croaks. I'm expecting Ted DiBiase's money, money, money to come across and to be like dollar bills going across the screen. <laughs> the clash of the cash. Yeah. In 2012, when we met them in the in the county final, there was a, a nice little movement online about it being the clash of the cash. So that's very, love very that. funny. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Very good. I'm sure plenty of people know that they're considered affluent areas of Dublin. So that semi-final, that should be a bit of a cracker. Also, I'd say the same about Nafina against Luke and Sarsfields. So just to clarify or to uh, go over what happened in the quarterfinals, Kula beat Bally Bowden after extra time, 127 to 28 points. Kilmacud Croaks had, you know, very little hassle against Plunkett's 126 to 19. Luke and Soft Crave Kieran by four points, and Nafina beat Jude's after extra time. Very exciting game. Um, the free's been missed all over the place, but uh Two of those four quarterfinals went to extra time. Start off with Kula and Kilmacud Croaks. You'd have to ask how much has changed since the first uh, time they met earlier this season in the group game. Croaks won 324 to 18 points. It was a modern father of Baton's, and Ronan Hayes was on fire. He scored 310 that day. But anybody, you know, anybody can win an early group game. You know what I mean? It's when when push comes to shove and there's, you know, there's no trap door. That's when you're going to really find out, you know, how good either these two are. And I think you have a fair idea what you're going to get from Kula. You definitely couldn't be sure with what you're going to get from Crocs. Like just going back through, um, you know, maybe this is uh, again. Uh, sorry now to people of Clanlara, but you're wondering, you know, Clanlara have all this potential, and to me, they didn't, you know, haven't fulfilled their potential. And I would say, you know, Crocs are very, very similar. And I just the question I pose is: Are are Crooks the new Clan Lara, in the sense that if you look at 2016, lost the final by a goal to Kula. 2017, lost the final by a goal to Kula. 2018, lost re replay the final by a goal to Ballyboden. When games are really there to be won at the very end, they've been found wanting uh, in in recent years. And for the players that they have, you have to say that they're they are underachieving. And this is a huge game for them. It'd be a statement win if if they can do it. Um, and it's going to be such a it's going to be a really really tasty game. I would put no stock whatsoever on the first round game earlier this year. Zero, none. I think this all bets are off for this game. Yeah, well, like there's a lot of scoring power in that Crokes team. Ronan Hay has been the most obvious. Like he's probably himself and Danny Sutcliffe are probably the premier forwards in Dublin hurling at the moment. So you know, I've compared him with like. The way that I compared Davy Fitz with Austin Gleeson, I'd just be saying the same about Ronan Hayes and James Callan at the moment. In that, like, there are certain uh, traits that you think that's similar. Big, big fella can hurl, can move. I'm not saying he's done what Callan's done, obviously not. But there's just certain similarities where you think this lad can kick on and on and on if things go right for him. So Alec Considine, he scored four points the first day out against Kula. He scored a goal the last day. Quaylen Conway can score. Fergal Whiteley's a county player. He can score. Then you have Larkin McMullen, who's the down player, uh, originally from down. He's an excellent player. Giantino O'Callig, like he's another threat that we've seen in and out of the team the last few years. And look, the thing is with Kula, the first day out, there's a lot of players that, that were playing that mightn't necessarily be playing now. And there's some lads who, who just have been injured straight up. So you, you'd have to say that for Kula, that like Oshin Goff hasn't been there. <clears throat> Mark Shute hasn't been there at all. Paul Shute has obviously retired. Colin Cronin's away in Australia this year. There's one or two other lads who've been in and out through injuries at different stages. But, you know, Simon Timlin, he's gotten himself fit. He's back in the team. Uh, John Shannon, while Keno Callan is back at full back, he had been injured. So John Shannon was full back the first day out, probably a little bit, didn't fully suit him that day. And Ronan Hayes had a good afternoon of it. So Keno Callan being full back tightens up that back line massively. I mean, you, like I always found when you're playing in the half back line and you know Keno Callan's behind you, you know, it's a fair old safety net. He's, he's just head and shoulders above all the full backs in Dublin over the last number of years there. Um, Outside of Ono Donald, obviously. Outside, of, yeah, okay, that's a fair point, yeah. Outside of Ono Donald. And, um, like, even in the forward line, you know, Con wasn't playing the first day out. So, you know, things, there's there's a nice bit of change in there 
so it won't be the same Kula team. And like we saw last year, group stages absolutely paddled by Nafina, turned around and won the county championship. So if I'm going to try and build up Kula a little bit, I'm going to say we're going to see a new four, a new um, a new three in Keno Callahan, a new fourteen in Cano Callahan. Uh, David Tracy's playing really well. He's carrying the team in many ways. Jake Malone has settled into the centre back. Sean Moran probably needs to contribute a little bit more. He's getting those goals and finishing brilliantly, but I just want to see him in the game a little bit more. He's in kind of more in the forwards here. Sean Tracy would be hoping that he's gotten over an injury from the last day and he can kind of um I don't get into the play a little bit more like he would have in the in previous years. So from that point of view, I think Kula should be an awful lot better from that first day out. I don't expect to see what was it, 324 to 18 points or or whatever it is. I'll just double check that score. I think line. it was 316 to 15, was it? No? Or okay, maybe I'm actually, thinking of another. No, I'm thinking that's I have the Napier, that's the Napier no, score I have in my head. It was 324 to 18. Like that's 15 points. That's that's a mother and father of Athens. But I don't expect to see that. Uh, I I think like those county finals that you've mentioned there, I think there will be a puck of a ball into it. And obviously I'm not gonna go against my own boys, am I? No, definitely not. Who do you expect to be picking up Connor? Who's the most likely to pick up Connor? Um, I would say Bill O'Carroll because he has done, and you know he, he doesn't mind dishing it out. I think I think Bill O'Carroll is the most likely there. I think Eddie Gibbons in goals, very good goalkeeper. Obviously Sean Brennan at the other end, county panelist. He's very good with the puck outs and very comfortable and made brilliant saves the last couple of days. See, this is the thing with Kula. The last uh, couple of the games this year. St. Bridget's had a chance to to win that game, and it was Sean Brennan making brilliant saves. Then the last day out against Bowden too, he made a couple of very good saves. So that's a huge advantage for Kula to have someone like him in the goals. And let's just see then. We'll move on to the other quarterfinal. <clears throat> um, Michael Verney will be back in a second. I think he's just dropped off the line there. The other, um, actually, he's just back there now. So just to get your prediction, who do you think is going to win in Kula and Crooks? Um, I think I I go for what I know. I think I go a cooler just to. It could be a scrape over the line job, but uh, I think you know the the result the last day beating a side like Bowden in a quarter final. Um, I think that will give them an awful lot. Not confidence. They've got plenty of confidence, but it will definitely up things another five or ten percent. I think Con um having another two weeks of hurling under his belt. Obviously, he's playing a bit of football too at the moment, but having another two weeks of hurling under his belt would definitely help him as well. Um, I'm not sure if he's as good as he was a couple of years ago in the sense that there was a time there when the hurl was in his hand, you know, constantly for months on end and he just hit crazy heights. We were talking about best winter hurlers. Like if you look at who was the, one of the best winter hurlers in recent years, you'd have to say him. Uh, he was absolutely phenomenal. The longer they go, the better the better he's going to get. And the better I think they're going to get as a side. And all of a sudden, that muscle memory of being in this situation in a semi-final where maybe there's a score between them and Crokes and knowing that they have the stuff to get over the line. And maybe Crokes, uh, knowing that in recent years, they maybe haven't got over the line. I think if, if it's a tight game, cool a win. Um, mm. I'll put it to you that way. Uh, and I, I don't see it bearing any resemblance to the group game earlier on in the year. I, I'd give Kula the edge just about. Yeah, I think it's going to be a puck of a ball, though, like we're saying there, Trout. Um, Nafina against Luke and Sarsfield. Now, funnily enough, we've kind of we had that debate during the group stages when we were trying to rank those Dublin teams. Who do you put higher in the pecking order? Do you put Luke and, or Nafina? And I was saying, well, over the course of the years, Luke might have only gotten to one final in recent times, but they've been there, thereabouts in the semi finals. They've had big wins over the years. They, I remember 2012, even going back to when Bally Bowden were more or less unbeatable in the early stages of the group. They beat them. They've just gotten so consistently so far in the championship. Once or twice left semi-finals behind them. I was sort of saying, you can't just give Navina the nod ahead of them just yet because they haven't really delivered. I mean, they've got all the talent. They've got a lot of talent there. No doubt about that. But until they start converting that to big championship wins, how can you, you know, how can you put them ahead of Lucan? Yeah, if Kula Crokes is the clash of the cash, this is like style versus substance, really. It's, like, you know, you know, and Afina are going to bring an awful lot uh, between Donald Burke, Rush, Shane Barrett. They're good. They've, you know, they have a lot of classy players. Lucan, uh, when you go down through their side, they've got lots of classy players as well, but they've got an awful lot of substance to them. And they've, like, rarely, if you go back through recent years in Dublin, You'd rarely say that like Lucan have underperformed in big games, or you'd rarely point out a championship year to say, "Oh yeah, they disappeared off the radar that year." They're usually they're quarter finalists nearly every year, 
and they're semi-finalists, you know, maybe more often than not as well, even though they haven't maybe been in that many finals. And you go down through their team and you're looking at the two crummies, Paul and Chris, the two McCaffreys, uh, John and Matt, Peter Kelly, it's great to see him, even though he's not playing with Dublin and hasn't been for a long time and won't be playing with them again, that he's still kind of going strong at half forward. My question for you would be, like, have they kind of found that kind of score and touch maybe that they need to compete with a cool or a Crocs or an Afina in this instance? Um, probably not. Uh, probably not. They do have good forwards up there. Um, Colin Walsh, I think, is another player. I think he made a great run setting up the the goal for who scored the goal the last Paul Crummy the last day, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think he did a great run to set up that goal. Um, they've had Chris Crummy in the forwards in recent years. He seems to be back centre back now. I do I do think there's there has been and there continues to be an issue with whether they have the scorers up there. But like maybe Paul Crummy will catch fire in this game. Like he he's a very good player. He's obviously a county panelist. We saw him in the Leinster final. Um, but he, here's one I'll throw back to you. How many county titles have Nafina won? Oh, Janey. Um I don't expect you to know the answer, but just it's kind of just to beef up my argument. Have they won one in my lifetime? They've never won one. How never many won Luke, one. How many have Lucan won? Uh, Lucan have won a few, I'd say. They've won none. And <laughs> how, how many final appearances have these two clubs had between them in Dublin? And considering one of them will be in the final after this. Lucan were beaten in by Bowden in 13, I think. That, that's uh, good knowledge right there. I don't know if Nafina have been... Ooh, not offhand, I don't know. They have one county final appearance between them. Really? So Nafina have never been to a final, so this is huge for them. This is absolutely massive. Now, unless there's something wrong with the, the Wikipedia page, that's not always trustworthy. But I just checked it there because I was just curious uh, to see, you know, if I was to add a historical context to this debate over who should be ahead of who in the power rankings, neither of them have won a county title and Nafina have never been there, which is quite incredible. But you, you've kind of listed out some of the players that Nafina have. It is time for them to deliver because, you know, Liam Rush is probably 31, maybe 32 now. He's had so many injuries, but with his form with Dublin this year, he's kind of back to where he was. But you just don't know when the next injury will come when you've had that history of, of picking up different knocks. So he's there now. The time is now. Donald Burke, I know the freeze and extra time went against him and Colin Curry had to take over them in the Jude's game. But, like, he can score from anywhere. He generally is a guy who knocks over the freeze, no problem at all. Shane Barrett, he's been dropped off the Dublin panel, but he still really should be a very, very good player at this level. Like, they do have good players. Um, and but I just I still don't know if I can trust them. I don't know if I can trust them yet. The absolute grit of Lucan makes me lean towards them. And you named all the players to have. Like I saw Johnny McCaffrey give one of the most fantastic displays in the semi final a couple of years ago, and his teammates around him let the side down. I can't remember who they lost in in that semi final. Uh, could have been it could have been one of the big teams too. But um, yeah, for me, it's just about Lucan. Conditions would probably favour Lucan. Would that be fair to say too? Well, I don't, I don't think the likes of Liam Rush would care too much about what weather he's playing in. But yeah, I am slightly thinking Lucan would prefer it. If you're talking about grit and trap tree, you're probably going with Lucan. I am. I'm going I, tra Lucan. Trap tree is going to catch on here, by the way. 100%. <laughs> like a bit of talk on, trap tree is going to catch on here. <laughs> to be honest, I'd probably go with Lucan as well. Um, and I know I bigged up Nafina earlier on in the year. But like the only thing I'd say is Nafina beating Jude's after extra time getting over the line in a really tight game, that maybe a game that they weren't supposed to win or didn't look like winning, I wonder will that instill a bit more belief. But as you say, historically, like they, they don't, they haven't been in a final before. It would be a, it would be a massive step if they, if they could get there. But uh, probably just about outside with Lucan as well, particularly with the way conditions are going. Like I'm looking at conditions outside here and in around the Dublin area, conditions are so soft and uh, Parnell Park is going to be so demanding, yeah. I I I'll go with I go with the one I know who's going to what they're going to deliver on a given day. But neither of them I would have this massive history behind them now either. Sean O'Sullivan says in Ken McGrath's book he talked about how he could hear the Kilmacud matches from his bed in the Beacon, and it helped him through while he was getting his heart sorted. So croaks for me. Ah, uh, that's Shane brilliant. Pop that's brilliant. I, I I never heard that before. That's that's class. Yeah. That that would that that's mad. Like he's such a hurler man could hear all this even just imagine in that position you could just hear hurled off each other like you just be you would kind of come alive yeah shane power says gotta love the wrestling references bernie uh keep going and you'll be the new awfully jp mcmanus in five years time 
Yeah, I don't know about that now. Yeah, Niall Heffernan, such a shame Khan is playing the wrong sport. I'm sure he wouldn't agree. Donegal finals this weekend. We do have Hurling up here. It's Satanta going for three in a row against St. Eunan's at Dunlow. Play Bl- or sorry, St. Eunan's Dunlow play Bally Shannon in junior. Dunlow in second year of adult and reached their second final. Um, we might as well talk about the Donegal final now. You have some of the details of uh, Satanta against Yeah, Eunan's. it's funny. It was, it was next, next up on the agenda. Uh, it's obviously a repeat of last year's final, Satanta and Unions. Uh, Satanta are going for three in a row. Satanta have a fairly star-studded side by all accounts. Uh, Danny Cullum was the Nicky Racker Cup Player of the Year last year. He's a real solid player anywhere between defence and midfield. Um, I think for, I think Davin Flynn is still with them, um, who was a former Tipperary underage star and was brilliant in that Racker Cup final last year. And Declan Coulter, who was obviously formerly of Armagh and uh, he married into Satanta he'd be you know a massive player for them as well a brilliant attacker too so like there wasn't I don't think there was too much between them when they played the last year's final but I definitely be probably stumping for Satanta again given the amount of uh, they have good natural talent up there as well and homegrown talent but the couple of kind of uh, Niall Cleary from Offley's there as well from Shinron he's in he's uh, with Satanta too They've got a lot of good imports as well to buff to kind of beef up what they have already. So find it hard to go against the Tanta there. Yeah, well, lads, are you procrastinating with the club rankings against us, Niall Heffern. We'll get to that quickly. There's a couple of items we were going to have on the list today, but we're gonna we're gonna move on from from those and maybe do them the next day out. Leitrim fine, Clunan Imont against Carrick Hurland. Carrick are going for five in a row. They've played the last four finals between them, and uh, there was a little bit of history made on Bank Holiday Monday when Carrick and Clunan Imont contested the first Leitrim under seventeen hurling final. So yeah, uh, yeah. good to good to see. I think um, Carrick were play, Carrick played some of their underage hurling in Longford as well, just to give them more exposure. They're obviously, um, I think they I think they just about neighbour each other or touch off each other there. So it's good to see that uh, that's a good sign for the future of hurling in. Um, in Leitrim, that they're playing underage competitions there now as well. And then just in the Sligo final, obviously, Neighbour and County of Leitrim, it's Eastgee against Nave Owen on Sunday in Markovich Park. That's a repeat of last year's final. Eastgee won it by a pint. And if he, if Eastgee are to do back-to-back, you'd imagine that stopping Jero Kelly Lynch would be probably the main task that they have. Uh, dual star with Sligo, really, really good player. Um, so if Eastgee are to win back-to-back, they're going to have to stop O'Kelly Lynch. And uh, we'll uh, just read out the Camogie Players Player of the Year shortlist here. Eva Donahue, Galway, obviously Terrier in midfield and a scorer too. Neve Kilkenny, her partner in the centre area between the 265. She's obviously been excellent for a long, long time. And Hannah Looney, who was very, very good for Cork this year also. Is it time we do it? Is it time for the club power rankings? Yeah, my only worry, Shane, is that I think came up on my phone there about a minute ago to say that I had 20% battery left. So we're in a small bit of a race against time, but that'll just focus our minds a little bit more. Okay, let's get it straight off the bat here. Ballyhale Shamrock's in at number one, and there's probably no point in even labouring the point. They're no. absolutely brilliant. D- 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 can, can't argue with that. And they're still going strong, and look, they're the favourites for the All-Ireland and heavy favourites at this stage. It's, 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 be, it's after them is where it gets really interesting. Is there a place for another Kilkenny team in the power rankings? Ooh, maybe. I think certainly people in Kilkenny would feel that, like, if the likes of James Stevens... Like, if James Stevens got out of there, do you think they could go win an All-Ireland? Like, look at their results in Leinster the last few years. Have any of those teams pulled up trees? I mean, with Kula, we, we beat the Kilkenny teams every time. Yeah, uh, James Stevens to me, would be the only other Kilkenny team that would we could potentially put in the top 10. Um, and if they were going to... I, I, just, I just reference them there. Uh, that they could be hovering in around 9 or 10, potentially, depending on what we have there, even though they're not still left in the championship. Mm, okay, so are you putting Kula in here? <laughs> yeah, so the weekend, they could be gone after the weekend, but I, st- I still am of the belief that, that they could go on a big run in Leinster if they get out of Dublin again. Do I think some of the other Dublin teams will go on the run that Kula will go on? No, I don't. So I definitely would have him in there. Not sure as of the number at the moment. Would I have any other Dublin team in there? Crokes haven't won a county title in seven years. Nafina haven't won a county title. Lucan. Um, Ballyboden are gone, obviously. Yeah, Ballyboden probably would have been the next highest Dublin team up for me, if I'm I'm honest with you. Um, And they obviously were in the Leinster final recently. But 
don't think I could have them in the in the top ten either. So I definitely would have Cool in the mix, as I'm sure you would. What about Sam Mullins? Now, I mean, uh, the Dallas have done pretty well, and you know, got to a Leinster final there in recent times in twenty late twenty nineteen. But I and beat Kula, so obviously, you know, when they've written most recently met, they got that win. No Oshin Goff, no uh, Cronin, and no Conor Callahan the same day. He came on late on, but he wasn't able to move. So to me, I would still be having Kula ahead of St. Mullins by dint oh. of winning the couple of county or all Ireland's. Oh, God, yeah, definitely. That's where the legacy comes back into it. Um, if we're talking about a Carlo team in the top 10, it's Mount Leinster Rangers would not be far off that top 10. And they're obviously county champions. This year's county champions haven't beaten St. Mullins in that county final. Yeah, OK. But it's just the performance that Mullins put up against, uh, well, obviously beating Kula and then the fact that they did pretty well against Ballyhale. You know, you, you couldn't just ignore that. No, you, would, you, would, you wouldn't ignore it, in fairness. Um, and obviously, I think Marty Cavan was only back from injury this year when they were beaten by Mount Leinster in the final. I think, I think Mount Leinster won, have won back-to-back since Mullins were in that Leinster final, though, haven't they? Yeah, I think yeah. so, yeah. 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 Um, OK, then Munster. Um, hey, the relax team... now, relax now, relax now. Wexford, other just if you, any Wexford teams that would come into the no, mix? No, 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 not even not in the debate. Jeez, no. Martin's really disappointed for the potential that they have, and ended up in a relegation playoff. Obviously, Owlers yeah. have gone down, so they're no longer in this conversation. Yeah, um, okay, so me, yeah. yeah, I'm happy so, with so that. Anyone else? Any Offaly team? Being honest, no, not in not in recent years. Um, if it was a couple of years ago, Kilcarnock would be in the conversation definitely, but. Uh, yeah, Rangers, got to yeah. the final in 2017. Um, if I remember correctly, yeah, we beat them 123 to 19. So I mean, that's yeah. not really challenging top ten, is it? No, and and they Rhinus have been the team that have been dominating an awfully in recent years. When Rhinus won in 19, they were well beaten by Rat Downey. So can't really have them in the mix there. I tell you no. what, though, for the neighbours in Leash, like Clock Balacala won the county title well last year, and are back in a county final again this year. Um, be interesting to yeah, be interesting to see how they how they would go. I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't rule them out of the top ten. Yeah, but like I don't think Leash teams have gotten to a, a Leinster club final in a long time. I'm actually trying to Google it there now. Castle, Leash, Castle Leash, Town, two thousand and two against Sheep. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. That that's a, that's a fair point. Yeah. The, the, and we we, yeah. we battered Burris Kilcotton. You know, I know Rat Downey were pretty had a good match against St Mullins a couple of years ago, but. Yeah, I don't think we could quite put a leash to you. I don't got the four goals, didn't he, against Boris up in up in Parallel Park, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, look, get your comments in. Let us know why a team should go in here, not just who. Definitely need to know why. There's a, there has to be a good bit of reasoning, like not just because they're county champions. And they, we kind of need a bit more need a bit more than that. Okay, so let's jump into some of the Munster teams now. If we've missed anyone in Leinster, please do let us know. You know, you might mention some of the West Mead teams, but I'm not sh- sure they've done quite enough to be in the in the top ten here. Valier. No Tony Kelly, that puts them out of conversation for me. I think so, yeah. To be honest yeah. with you, I think so. Like, they, If they win Clare, they're not going to go on a run in Munster. You know? No. Kilmallock, I mean, I, I would have thought Napiershig would be here and we'd be talking about Napiershig. But this is a Kilmallock team that got to an All-Ireland final six years ago. Obviously haven't been back, hadn't won a county title since, but now maybe they're on the road. And like, I interviewed Graham Mulcahy and he was talking about I asked him, would his brother Jake be back? Would Paddy O'Loughlin be back? He doesn't know. But, you know, maybe they'll come back in and all of a sudden they might go on a real run because Munster's open. Yeah, but potentially, yeah. They've obviously won a Munster title before as well. Uh, I do think conditions will suit them. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule out them out of top 10. Definitely not. Dude, are Napiershig in the mix here, even though they're gone? Yeah, well, look, Niall Heffernan made a very fair point here. Napiershig with a full team and squad are top five. Yeah, okay. Uh, I agree with that. Oh, I 100% agree, yeah. Uh, it's just, yeah. There's that many, like, Peter Casey's going to be gone for nine months. Like, you know, I, I'm taking, like, just, if we had to start the next year, Napierstrick still aren't going to be the same beast. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, dep- <laughs> it's hard to know. They obviously won Limerick last year. Didn't win a semi-final this year. I think put an asterisk beside Napierstrick. Yeah, but like we're going to be putting asterisks everywhere here. I ah, no, I don't. I don't think we will. I don't think we. I don't think we will. Like I put it this way: Are we going to have a Cork team in here? No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's that's grand. We're not going to be putting that many asterisks in then. Don't worry. Um, 
I would put an asterisk beside the pair sheet. If we're looking at Tipperary, what Tipperary things do you think are in the top, potentially in the top 10? Like if Boris Lee have everyone fit, I think Boris Lee can be in there. And like, obviously, had to, we're talking about the form of a couple of years ago. That is the most recent Monster in All-Ireland series we've seen. But then again, I'm fancying Kildangan to win this county championship. So can we put both of them in? Are you fancying Boris Lee to win this weekend? I mean, oh, yeah. I said, of course, yeah. I, of course, yeah. I said, of course, I said yeah. that the home team are going to win. Of course, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, I put an asterisk beside Boris Lee as well. I would definitely, I personally, and I'd say you're the same. I want Kiladangan in my top ten. Yeah, I, I yeah. think I want them in there too. I think so, it would have been intriguing to see how they'd gone last year, particularly in summer conditions. I think it would have been fascinating to see how we go. Slock Neil are in there. I think Slock Neil have to be in there. The, yeah. the thing about the the Antrim champions is Dunloy are obviously Antrim champions. It's been cushioned all, it's been Loch Eel, it's been Dunloy. And the last Ulster champions were Schlock Neil. So Schlock Neil get a fit or three or four positions ahead of any other Ulster team, in my view, here. And I haven't seen enough from Dunloy, this Dunloy team in provincial, to you know, to have them even in the top 10, I'm not sure. I don't think you can. I don't think so, no. I mean, Cushendall won it in 2018. But other than that, it's Schlock Neil 3 the last four. Um, yeah, I'm with you. I don't think an Antrim team gets in here at the moment. Shane, my battery's going to go here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move my table over here, plug out my headphones and charge my phone. I'll be back online in 30 seconds. Right. Okay, well, that's interesting. This is, uh, this is the ups and downs when you're going with a live broadcast. Um, I'm going to throw out a few more teams and see what people think. First off, Andrew Sullivan says, Napiershik are being hit hard due to Limerick going so well. A fully fit Napiershik are top five. Paul Fitz says, Kiladangan have a load of club hurlers. Billy Seymour, Alan Flynn, Barry Hogan, Paul Flynn, Dan O'Mara and Joe Gallagher. They're savage club hurlers. They absolutely are. And like as Michael just said there a minute ago, how would they have done in, in Munster last year if they had to get through? And then how would they be doing again this year if they had the experience of Munster and they were able to apply it again? And maybe that's a reason, good reason to have Boris Lee high up in the pecking order here because they have that experience, they have that know-how. You're not going to like fear going into a Munster club game. You've been there before in Munster with those games. Thomas Gallagher says, Schlock Neil, Lock Giel and Cushendall top three. Not sure about placings because Lock Giel have won in All-Ireland. But, uh, but SN have strongest in past years. SN? I'm not fully sure. Uh, Loch Neil, maybe, again, in past years. So here's the question now. Burs, are Kiladangan are most recent county champions in Tipperary. Where do they go in the pecking order in terms of, like, every team, most of the teams that we're talking about here ahead of them, Kula, Ballygunner, St. Thomas's, and all those, they've already... Um, They've already played in those Munster Club Championships and Leinster Club Championships and so on. So I've thrown uh, Schlock Neil in here. Right, so so far, this is the 10 we have in no particular order. Shamrocks, Ballyhale, uh, Kula, Ballygunner, St. Thomas's, Mount Leinster Rangers, Kilmalik, Napierzig, Bursley, Kiladangan and Schlock Neil. It's a fair 10, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Often wonder, does everyone here work? Can, I can't imagine our bosses would be too happy if half the day was spent watching a live YouTube. Don't mind show. that. Do what makes you happy in life. Do you know what? I've kind of changed my opinion on Cork. I think Black Rock are the real deal. I thought, um, I was surprised when you didn't have them in from the start, to be honest with you. Um, not that you've been bullish about them, but you definitely think they have the potential, I would think, to go on a bit of a run in Munster. And you're obviously predicting them to win Cork from here on as well. Yeah, so the, like Michael O'Halloran, um, like Cashman in the back line has been impressing me. Robbie Cotter, Alan Connolly is going to be a top player for Cork, I reckon. Yeah, I think there's enough there for us to, to sort of definitely have them in the conversation. Glen Rovers, not entirely convinced. Like their runs in, in Munster haven't really impressed me. Emma Killy don't aren't allowed to play in Munster. I don't think I want to put a divisional side in this conversation. Do you? No, God no. It'd be like putting UCD or UCC in. Yeah, and uh, outside of St Thomas's, there's no one in Galway that I'd be. Not really. No, Mellows Cap Mellows are relegated, were they? Uh, Capitagon were beaten in the quarter final last weekend. Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, I'm just trying to think: is there anybody else that we're kind of leaving out? I probably, yeah, I'd have no issue with putting the Pearshig in the top 10, I have to yeah. say. Are we are we wrong in Dunloy? Three in a row Antrim champions, but haven't done it in Ulster, so, you know, depends on where, depends on where, yeah, depends on where you're ranking Schlock Neil. Well, okay, let's do it, so. 
Do you think Ballygunner are a number two team here, despite not the only relative success? Are they on track to? Are they? Would you expect Ballygunner to win an All Ireland or Kula Thomas's Kilmalik to win? Who do you think is higher in the pecking order to win an All Ireland this year? Um, Ballygunner probably are, but I can't give them the number two spot. No, something something won't let me give them the number two spot until they go and prove it. Last time I saw them in a pro provincial game, they were beaten in the 2019 Munster final, having gone in as roaring hot favourites against a Borussia Lee side that had never been out of the province before. That team had never been out of the province before. And they flopped on the big occasion. So, yes, they've beaten, uh, you know, they've beaten all around them in Waterford and delivered huge performances in county finals. But, no, not for, I can't give them two. Okay, so uh, are you keeping in your head at Arcula number two here? Um, because I'll put my, you this my, way. My, my fear is right. All the injuries I've named, plus Paul Shootanger, are retired, and Colm Crone is not involved, and obviously I'm no longer involved. <laughs> 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 oh, Jerry, Mac. I, I don't know what to say. I'm sure what to say to that, to be honest. Don't worry, I've slated myself there in that sentence, so you don't if, even need to. If Kula, if Kula win this weekend, I think they end up playing Ballyhale in a Leinster final. I'll put it to you that way. Yeah, I think a lot of people would go with that, even though Nafina would say, well, we beat Kula well last year if they get through. Oh, no, yeah, the, no, 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 problem with, no, no problem with that at all. But um, I do think they get to, if they win this weekend, they get to a Leinster final. So there's a question about Mount Leinster. Can you see them beating any of the eight finalists at the Kilkenny Championship? Maybe, maybe, but I don't, like, do I go through it here? Do I think Mount Leinster would be cool? I think it'd be a good game. Bally Gunner, geez, I think they'd give most of these teams a good game, but I'm not sure that Mount Leinster are at the height they were at when they got to the All-Ireland final. The, so, the viewer is asking, would they beat any of the eight Kilkenny quarter finalists? Yeah. Yeah, I think they'd beat four of them, mm. probably. They wouldn't beat Bally Hale, I don't think. I don't think they would. I don't think they'd beat the village. Um, they'd beat Tullerone? Give them a right good game. Yeah, I think. I think no, I think no, I think they would be Tullerone. Yeah, I, yeah, no, yeah, I think that's a bit dis. I think that's a bit disrespectful. No, I think they would. I think they'd be at least half of them. Yeah. Yeah, and I think all Auckland, but I think all Aucklands would beat them. Um, then I think all Aucklands would have the kind of nous to maybe beat them and the experience to beat them. But yes, I think they'd be potentially might be five of the eight. And all Aucklands were in a Leinster final there in 2016-17. Uh, they've changed their team around a little bit. Should they be in this conversation? Oh, I don't think so. If I was going to have another Kilkenny team, I'd, I'd be having I'd be having the village in on, yeah, a bit on this year's form, but a lot on last year's form as well, where they should have been the team to take Ballyhale off their perch. Yeah, so do Kilmalik go higher in the pecking order than the Piercic, first of all? Like, I, full, fully fit, I think the Piercic are probably number two or three here. I think they're number two fully fit, yeah. Yeah. And then look, the Nisha says here, Schlock Neil probably should have beaten the Pierce a few years ago and ran the Shamrocks very close in a the cracker. They've been within a puck of a ball and making a final. So Schlock Neil are probably top five, aren't they? Oh, they are. I think they are, Shane, to be fair, yeah. Would you have Thomas's or Schlock Neil ahead of each other? I'd have Schlock Neil. Ahead of Thomas's, yeah. I, th I think Thomas's have kind of flattered to deceive in recent seasons. Um, My only worry about Schlock Neil this year is the, some of the injuries they picked up towards the tail end of the county final. And that potentially Chrissy McCaig, Shane McGuigan, um, I think there was one other big injury. My only worry would be that to be missing some of them for the Ulster campaign. But uh, this is this is ideal cannon fodder for for clubs like Dunlay. Just paste it on the wall. Picture you, picture me, picture the top ten, and no Dunlay on it. Would you have Thomas's? Or uh, sorry, would you have Schlock Neil ahead of Bally Gunner? I'd, I'd have Bally Gunner ahead of him. No, I'd have, so Bally, I'd, I'd have Bally Gunner ahead of Schlock Neil. I have to say. SSRI said Westmead clubs are better than Schlock Neil. Tell us why. Oh, though. Tell us oh, why. I, I don't know how I don't know how you can I don't know how you can I don't know how you can justify that, to be honest but with based you. Based on what Nisha just said about pushing the Piercing and, and Shamrock's very close, I think we're very justified in having Schlock Neil up towards the very top. Oh, I think so. That was a better of a game between them and Ballyhale up in was that up in Nuri, was it, or where was it? Or it was Nuri, yeah, yeah. Nuri, yeah. yeah. Like, that was we an absolute better game. also. Now, we yeah. won them. Yeah, we we beat them, I think, well enough that day. But they're, they're still a good team. And obviously, that was a learning experience for them too. So at the moment, we have... This is the order we have at the moment. Um, Shamrocks, Kula number two, Ballygunner, 
Clark Neal, St. Thomas's, Kilmalik. Um, or do we go on the Pierchig, Burris Lee, Killadang, and Black Rock? Okay. Um, I, I think it would be a travesty if we left Nipirchik out of the top 10. But do you have to put the current champions ahead of them? You probably do. But Nipirchik are the ones that have delivered all of those monster titles. And they still have most of those players involved. I know David Breen isn't there anymore and Shane Dowling isn't there. But when they're 100%, I think they beat Kilmalik most days. Even though Kilmalik beat them on TV, I think, like a year and a half ago. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm talking myself around. <laughs> yeah. Myself around um, the circles. I'd probably still have Kilmalik. I'd probably have Kilmalik ahead of them just for the fact that they can actually go and win a Munster and they have a nice draw. Like, do. Like, Cork. Um, this might contradict now, but I think they're playing Cork in the Munster semi final. Would they beat Blackrock? I'd say they probably would just about. So they've a great, like, they've a great chance of being in the Munster final, which leaves them in, what, the last six in the country. So, uh, like, would you put Kill Killadangan ahead of them? Even though um, they experience Killadangan don't. Yeah, that's a good question. As I said, I thought Killadangan would have went really well last year. And I think if they get out of tip, they could still go well this year. Even though they're down to, are they down to play Bally Gunner in the Munster quarterfinal? I'm not entirely sure. I know they're on, they're on the wrong side of the draw anyway. It could be... Um, it could be Bally Gunner versus the Clare champions with Tip waiting in the semi final, if if my memory serves me correct. But yeah. I think Killadang will be Killadang will be a tough proposition for anybody, if I'm, to be honest. Yeah, will Tipperary get into a semi final against the winners of Clare or Watford in the Monster Club hurling? So that that will give Killadang or whoever else wins Tipperary that extra shot. Like I'm, I'm sure people in Lockmore are saying, "What about us?" And people in Turles are saying, "What about us?" And the same across other counties. Lockmore are. Fears consistent and are actually not far outside of the top 10, but I couldn't put them in. I couldn't put them in just based on when was the most recent county title hurling win? Uh, 2013 or 14, did it the double? Yeah, like you're, you're going back a long way. And I think the one before that then was when they got to the All Ireland Club semi final in 08. So, yeah, they're a really consistent side, but uh, don't only get a parachute them in there. I'd have no issue. You know, I still want the Pierce to get my 10. I, I would put... Killadangan wouldn't be below 8 for me. Would they be above Burris? Yes. Okay. In my in my opinion, anyway. But I'm, the, I'm probably... Yeah, Burris are in the most recent All-Ireland club final. I think a good bit has happened since then. No, um, that's true. You know, I think a good bit has happened. Killadangan have obviously uh, won their first county title. And they're, you'd say they're on course for their second. Now that could be ripped up after this weekend. But I'd still, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd have them, I wouldn't have them eight, nine or ten. I'd have them either six, seven or eight. So SSRI says uh, Westmead teams have been unlucky in Leinster the past ten years. Clan Kill and Raharney probably should have got to Leinster finals. That's true. Winter conditions make club championship games so hard to call. Sometimes it comes down to team spirit and bloody mindedness often over above uh, skill and class. So here's the, like, are you, are you with Kula at number two? I mean, my concern is I just don't, like, it'll take a lot to get to the team team to the same level again, considering the players that are currently missing are guys that are no longer, you know, not going to be there for the foreseeable future in terms of, like, Sikron and being away. I'm probably not happy with the at two, and I'm probably going to have to go back on what I said before. I'll probably put Bally Gunner too, because... Yeah, I, I'm the same as yourself. I don't think Cooler are the same beast that they were uh, two or three years ago. They're still high up, but probably couldn't. Have. Well, I'll put it to you this way. Can you have Kula ahead of Bally Gunner? And I know this goes against a bit of what I said earlier. Bally Gunner are champions. They're definitely going on a provincial run and have been provincial champions recently and were beaten by Bally Hale in a club semi-final by you know a score or two. Kula have a, to go a long way to get to the position, that position. And like Schlock Neil are already champions, like you said. So Shamrock's most likely going to win. And obviously going for three in a row All-Irelands. They're without question number one. <clears throat> Ballygunner champions. Schlock Neil champions. St. Thomas is very close to being champions. Kilmallock probably will be champions. Is it Kilmallock are champions, yeah. Sorry, Kilmallock are champions. I think it's only at that stage after that that you can put Kula in. Oh, there, yeah. Because, like, the last two years, like, Kula have obviously won, but they've taken 
there's been a couple of defeats that would have never happened during the All Ireland run those years. Do you know, like uh, getting annihilated by 15 points the first day out against Croaks, losing very heavily against Nafina last year. So not winning them in the same manner suggests there's a bit away from that All Ireland team in 2018. Yeah, okay. I, yeah. I, I, and I'm not yeah. trying to talk the boys down. I mean, I'm just saying there's a bit to prove before you get back to that. Yeah, Hopefully I don't think they. I don't think they drop from two to seven. I I've no problem having in, having them in the mix around four or five. Yeah. So, but like, would you would you have Bally Gunner underneath? I'd have Bally Gunner probably second now. Yeah. Realistically, would you, would you have Schlock Neil ahead of Kula? Ish. Uh, ish probably probably marginally at the moment just because of where they actually are and I think there's as you said with injuries and change in personnel Stock Neil haven't changed much Cool have changed quite a bit they could still go on and I still think they have a great chance of getting to an extra final I have to say Yeah, but it's just a, a fair bit to get there yeah it's just like in recent years like if you're going out without Ushing Goff former Dublin player uh, Mark Schutte Paul Schutte um, Colin Cronin. Colin Cronin. These are all lads who are absolutely key to the All Ireland, and wouldn't be available if they played tomorrow. That's where I think you'd have Bally Gunner, Schlock, Neil Thomas's, and Kilmalik all ahead of Kula just at the moment. But Kula obviously with scope to go back up. But it's just the questions are there. Obviously, Bally Hale at number one. Okay, just fly through the top five again. There, the new, the re- revised top five. Yeah. So Shamrocks, Bally Hale, Bally Gunner, Schlock, Neil, Saint Thomas's, Kilmalik, Kula at six. Okay, yeah, okay, I'm happy enough with that. Um, do, 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 do we... Is it hanging at seven? Yeah, I, I'm happy with that. I said I, do, I don't want them any lower than eight. I think there's massive scope there, I have to say. Uh, Boris Lee at eight, Napierschig at eight. Who else, are we, who else are we looking at outside of that? Black Rock, and uh, we've Mount Leinster here. I can't have Boris Lee in the top ten. Okay. I can't have Boris Lee in the top 10 because I don't think they're winning this weekend. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Like. There's a gag in order on you. No, I, listen, I understand that you, you can't say much on that. I I just, yeah, I, I think Kiladangan are a decent bit ahead of the rest in tip yeah. at the moment. Yeah, look, I, I'm I'm happy to go with Kiladangan at seven. Do we want an appear to get eight, even though like they're gone, they're done for the season, and who knows what the... like. You know, if I said about Kula not having players, obviously Shane Dowling and David Breen aren't going to be there. So they're not going to be quite the same next year. Yeah, so, no, they I still think they'd, they'd have a match. I still, would, it, would it be a shock to the system if Napierschik were the 2023 All-Ireland Club Champions? No, it wouldn't be. With Mike Casey back, with Peter Casey back, with Jerome Boylan back, uh, with the regular keeper back, Will O'Donoghue... Um, Adrian Breen, David Dempsey. No, that wouldn't be a shock to the system. So I still think they deserve to be in there. They're are they, they're the only team that will be included in the top ten that aren't still in the championship. I'd say, but yeah, but they have the credit in the bank to have done that. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I do agree. I do agree. Uh, Bazaroni says too many Munster teams, as Kilkenny and Galway teams, have dominated the All Ireland Club Championship in the fifty years has been played. But to be fair, Galway teams got straight into an All Ireland semi final, which. You know, in hindsight, it's a bit of a joke. I'm not saying the Port Humna, Athenry, etc. wouldn't have won them, but it's a joke that any county team gets straight into a semi-final. Yeah, and as regards Kilkenny teams dominating, it's really been Bally Hale from what we're judging on at the moment. Like The Village won one in 04, 05. Um, O'Loughlin's were beaten. Were O'Loughlin's beaten in a final? Uh, one year? Sorry? Against Clarenbridge 2011? Clarenbridge, yeah. Um, Greg Bally Callum were beating them one in the early 2000s. But like I think we're we're really looking at the last probably five years. Yes, Ballyhale have been really dominant. If you're going to include another Kilkenny team, it would be the, it would be the village for me again. But they're out. Do I I see the Pearshick potentially winning an All Ireland next year, even though they're out? Do I see the village winning an All Ireland next year? I don't, if I'm honest, and that's a lot to do with Ballyhale maybe. But even without them, I, I still don't think. Don't not even sure if they'd win Leinster if they won Kilkenny. That's no you know no respect to a great club. Declan O'Keefe, it's next to impossible to do a top 10, never mind taking injuries into account. Are Kilmalik even higher without injuries? Maybe, maybe so. But this is the 10 we have at the moment. Let's see. We should finish up now. We've dragged on a nice bit. I'm sure people are enjoying it all the same. But Shamrocks of Valley Hale at number one. We're both agreed on that. We don't need to, 
to to go over that again. Um, Bally Gunner there in second. Um, next you have uh, Schlock Neil saying Thomas's. Should should Thomas's be ahead of Schlock Neil by dint of actually winning the county title and getting to a final again most recently? Yeah, I'm uh, having St. Thomas's at three. Jeez, they were annihilated in that final, Shane. I know, but they did get to it. They did get and to it. One, one. It's, it's, yeah, I know. That's eight years okay, ago. So if you, if, right, so who uh, who has the most top-rated players in the country? Fintan Burke, Davy Burke, Connor Cooney, Shane Cooney versus the proven quality of the Schlock Neal players, who are very good, you know, Brendan Rodgers, Christy McKay, etc., etc., Cormac O'Doherty. I think you'd say there's there's more proven on the St. Thomas' side. There probably is. The last time you saw them in uh, in an All-Ireland semi-final, you'd have to say they flopped, they flopped as well against Boris Lee. No, they did. But didn't they beat Schlock Neal the year before? They didn't. They beat Cushion Dahl up in parallel. Oh, Cushion Dahl, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, fair enough. If um, the two of them came up against each other, I'd probably be fancying Schlock Neal to dog it out, if I'm honest. Mm, but it, and I'm not saying that that wouldn't happen. I just think that Thomas's have a little bit more proven. Uh, yeah, may, maybe. Well, they probably do have a bit more proven, given the fact that they're um, they're the dominant force in a really really strong county, whereas Schlock Neal are getting it probably a lot easier in Derry. But Schlock Neal are the reign and Ulster champions, and as I said, they put it up to the team we have number one. They put it up to them in an All Ireland semi final. Something Thomas's didn't do. And the Pearsig, who would be either two or three, had they not got a load of injuries, they put it up to, put it up to them in an All Ireland semi final too. Yeah, uh, Thomas Galler says if this if it's this hard for hurling, can't imagine trying it for football. Well, Cara Finn would be number one yet. Yeah. Well, they didn't win the county title last year, so again, who knows? Um, right, so I'm go- I'm going to say let's push Thomas's number three, and we'll do battle again on it soon because we have to finish this up. Shamrocks one, Ballygunner two, Thomas's three, Schlock Neil four, Kilmallock five. Kula 6, Kiladangan 7, Napiershig 8, Black Rock 9, Mount Leinster 10. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that now. And the Boris and Levi's have as much ammunition as you like for this weekend. One thing I'd say is, I think there's a team or two in Tipperary that might beat Mount Leinster. I think Lockmore beat Mount Leinster, and I think Thurless would, and I think Boris would, assuming everyone's fit, of course. Okay. Um, we might have to argue the toss quickly for number 10 then. Like, do Boris deserve to be in a 10 instead of Mount Leinster in that case? Um, They've obviously won a Leinster. It's obviously a, a while back now as well. Um, Have they competed in a Leinster final since then? I don't think so. Mullins are obviously the most recent Carroll team to compete in the Leinster final and compete really, really well. Yeah, yeah. I th- look, I think... No, we can't. No, just, I know if it only takes a minute... we. If we can't settle on something, we're not we're not totally happy with. You you think you think uh, a couple of tip teams that beat Mount Leinster, then and I think the village it. would as well. I wouldn't disagree. I I've already said I wouldn't disagree with that. Yeah. earlier on in the show. Right. Who do I think is more likely to win in All Ireland? James Stevens, Bursley, Lockmore, Thurless. Is there any other team we're missing? No, Bazaroni. I'm not saying that at all. I think that the Kilkenny team's good. I think James Stevens could. I just don't think that all of the quarter finalists will be beaten by them. Um, the thing is, is, though, is that Mount Leinster are, are in the provincial race, whereas I don't think after this weekend Boris Lee will be. But so are Rapparees, but we're not putting Rapparees in this conversation. Yeah, I know, I know, I know Shane, but Mount Leinster have a lot of credit, more, way more credit in the bank than Rapparees have. We haven't won one in 20 or 30 years. Like Mount Leinster are reasonably well proven at provincial level. Okay, so. Oh, like more are still in it. Like, and uh, Turles are still in it. Boris are still in it. Uh, God Almighty, go on! You make the final call. Uh, I'm gonna go with the Leinster man and the Mountain man. We we'll leave. We we'll leave Mount Leinster at ten. Okay, so I'll just bring it up on screen just to clarify so everyone can see. This is just on a text edit file, so it's not exactly the most glitzy. But Shamrock to Ballyhale, Ballygunner, St Thomas's, Schlockneil, Kilmallock, Kula, Kiladangan, the Piercig. Of Limerick, uh, Black Rock, and Mount Leinster Rangers. I see one of the comments there. Someone saying they're going to have to go for a lie down. I think we will too after that. I think so. Yeah, my phone. My phone. I, I did well not to go out completely there. I somehow managed to scooch over here towards a, a charging point. 
Mm, absolutely. Okay. Well, look, that's it. Make sure you do subscribe uh, to the channel, bottom right hand corner uh, on YouTube. Get us over to 10,000. And obviously, follow us on all the other social channels as well. If you want the audio podcast, it's going to be on patreon.com forward slash our game, five or a month, and a great way to support the channel. Michael Verney, we'll do battle again. Thanks very much. Chat to you next week. Good luck this weekend, Shane, with your two hats on. <laughs> right. Good luck. The Hurling Show, brought to you in association with Torpy. Torpy are leading hurling into a new future with Bamboo, a revolutionary hurley created using their unique engineered hurling performance know-how. Already being used by many inter-county players, Torpy's Bamboo is highly sustainable, offers players greater striking distance and a more consistent balance every time, without compromising on natural feel. Check them out on the Torpy website and in the link below and enter the promo code OURGAME to get yourself 10% off.